Welcome to the Blooming League of Original Podcast. G'day and welcome to an extra well-behaved edition of Thrush and Treasure, the Torture Chamber musical comedy podcast where Danny Zuko ran Sid Vicious out of town using a souped up chitty chitty bang bang. And speaking of Ran Sid, I'm Aaron, and I'm joined as unusual by the man who arrived looking like he did in the catalogue, batteries not included, it's Mr. Craig Bioko. How's it going? It's going well. Uh, well, I've, you know, just been standing in the other room waiting. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of quiet time to myself. Enjoying the other room, enjoying the, you know, occasionally looking out the window. Mm-hmm. Uh, I appreciate you slipping some food under the door occasionally. No, I've, I've been okay. It's, it's a bit of... It's been an okay year. It's been an interesting year. It's yeah. been a character defining year. It's been a terrible year. It's been a terrible year. Some unfortunate things happened. I think I t- they may have happened last, before last time we spoke. I think I had yeah I had lost my pup uh, Boo. That was difficult. We lost Boo. Uh, she was a real warrior for fourteen years. She had some uh, issues from the beginning, uh, and she, we had been close to that a couple of times and uh it it last uh last may uh, you know we we couldn't get ahead of 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 what she had it was it was difficult i was doing a a musical at the time and i can't remember what we last spoke so i'll just say it and cut me off if i'm repeating myself but i was doing a a musical called Girl from the North Country. Mm-hmm. Brilliant play. And it was, you know, Bob Dylan music and all this. And it was very, I wouldn't know how to explain it other than to say that it, I never quite got into Bob Dylan music and I could never figure out why. I was always a melody, Beatles, monkeys, bright show music guy. But I knew that I should like Bob Dylan. I just could never find my way around to getting in there. And then I started doing the play and I realized, oh, it doesn't really make sense in a linear way. And every night it hit the audience like a power punch to the heart. There'd be this, I've never had a show, like never experienced anything like that on stage where we'd finish the show and there would be a collective, like nobody was breathing. And it wasn't because people were trying to guess whether it was over. It was because this, it was so effective. And yet we're doing a show that took place in the winter, uh, in 1933 uh, in Duluth and everybody's in a lot of trouble and they're singing Bob Dylan songs that have 70s references and yet it still worked, it still resonated. So I was closing the show around that time. It was a limited run and we were cl- about about to finish. We had a few weeks left and, and Boo started to, had some issues and we, we couldn't get ahead and, and mom came down you know, we're a little north of the city. So she'd come down and sit with Boo and uh, and Boo was slipping away. We could we could tell she was losing strength. She was such a warrior for 14 years. I, I think I thought she'll pull she'll pull it out. But we couldn't. It was it was uh, one of the hardest moments I've ever uh, I've ever had. But I have blessed with great friends, great parents and great family. And um, they knew that I, how close I was to this creature. She was a she was family. And so we 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 mourn her, and and it's a year later. I, I will say it's a, it's a it's easier. And if there's anybody out there who's going through that, don't listen to anybody who's there. Are people who actually say it never gets easier. Well, it, it does. You know, you wouldn't be able to function if it didn't. Uh, there's a place in the heart, and I also was blessed with a. Um, there's a guy who lives not far away from here who sent me a book. His name is Peter Chatsky, and he's been a friend for a while. He read about Abu. I, I posted something online, and he sent me this wonderful book by Eugene O'Neill, and I can't remember the title of it, but it's written from the point of view of Eugene O'Neill's dog. It's a very slim book. And it's basically his, it's the last will and testament of a marvelous dog or something like that. And I think he had kids. And he, and so it's basically the dog saying, you know, what we had was really special. Don't worry about me. We know more than you guys do. I'm paraphrasing, of course. I don't think Eugene O'Neill ever said guys once. Uh, but it, it was basically, it would be a shame to not have another dog and keep this going. Yeah. And then it was very funny. It was like, don't expect the dog to look as good in my raincoat. Don't, don't kid yourself. But uh, yeah. So he sent me that and, and uh, I burst into tears when he sent me that and, and which was only meant it was Wednesday because that's what I had been doing. 
But I have to say, it was one of the last times I did. It was one of the most gracious, kind things because the punchline is I'd never actually met Peter. He was just an online friend. He was like a Facebook friend who read this thing and did this extraordinary thing that moved me forward. So I, I like to think when these things happen, you, you, if you relax, do the things that you need to do and be patient. Yeah. We've had these conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, things good mm -hmm. things will happen. You just gotta you gotta be patient. Yep, yeah, just gotta learn to breathe. But just know, uh, Eugene O'Neill famously called people dude. I believe not guys. So he <laughs> really. No, that's a joke. <laughs> no, he did. Well, you know, dude in like the old cowboy sense. Yeah, true. Dude and ranch. Yeah. Howdy, partner. <laughs> uh, anyways, we'll yeah. move on. Uh, guess what? what? We have an extra special guest in the studio today. And it's like I always say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, you bring your mum along to protect you. Because this gorgeous gal turned super mum inspired the guys and dolls, especially her own pride and joy, to spread their wings and fly hair high, aiming for success in the city. And since actions speak louder than words, the powers that be unhitched the Wells Fargo wagon so this madman of the people could rise above the court and leave us mad about him. <laughs> but as every boy who went punk knows, he couldn't have done it without looking up while this stunning Cinderella man itched the Harrison players in Rybrook, New York. While at home, she read her boys' stories like Snow White always read dwarfs stories before a quick kiss goodnight. And so as the sun rises on this young and restless day, we gift a huge warm Aussie g'day and a happy Mother's Day as us two stooges celebrate this phenomenally unreal lady and all the unforgettable mothers out there who are there for their kids, whether on the first or 13th floor, and put up with unnecessary roughness from their head case kids, which wasn't at all a scary movie for this superstar mama. So before we get onto the music, man, thou shalt not forget to welcome to the torture chamber the best company a boy can have, whose body of work leaves us broken into a sweet seven pieces, but luckily we're easy to assemble, or we might be put on the blacklist before we get to meet this girl from the North Country with the boy from an empty church, because she's our extra, extra special guest and Craig's best girl, his mama, it's Lady Pat Campbell. Yay, welcome to the torture chamber. How are you going? <laughs> That was brilliant. Oh, That's yeah. my mommy you're describing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is such an honor to have you on here, Pat. It is Mother's Day. Was Craig good to you this morning? Yes, of course. He's always been very good to me. Awesome. Promise we'll behave. <laughs> so if we swear, we'll put a dollar in the jar. Okay. And that can go towards my KFC fund. Oh, you you have no idea. You ever seen The Sopranos? Yes. I started calling her Carmela a couple of years ago. <laughs> Particularly, you should hear, if an ex-girlfriend comes up. And hurts him. I can say Sailors, sailors run out of here crying. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nobody, nobody but my baby. It's right. That's it. Now feel free. We, we are uncensored, but it depends on the guest or if we're working with a PR company. Okay. Then we won't swear. But um, if look, if our guests swear, then well, we got no fucking problem with that. Yeah, awesome. Well, there we go. If your fans got a fucking problem with it, we will back <laughs> please, that shit please. off of that. Sorry. Oh, it's it's called respect, Craig. With anyways, oh, that's there's no money for my KFC fund. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> anyways, we'll move on. Now, did Craig warn you, Pat, about what this show is and what we do on here? Not really. Not really. Not really. I need to hear from you. Yeah, no. I, I did a late explanation, but I knew you would be able to explain it better than I could. Yeah, well, that's all right. Well, we, we've got some sort of fun questions and deep questions and some to, to keep you on your toes along the way. Oh, God. OK. Now we'll move on because last time Craig was here, we brought up when you were doing Thou Shalt Not that you got punched in the throat. Did you ever find out if Norbert had punched you in the throat? Oh, I did not know that. For some reason, I think it was the other way around. Norbert punched you. I think, I th no, I think I punched Norbert. Oh. I I'm not sure. I Either way, uh, the critics from, I don't read, sure I don't read the reviews, but the, but the, the critics, there was nothing left to punch, put it that way. No, Whatever. To, I'm sorry. I have some awful stories about that. Okay. But, but, but well, let's be careful. And also okay. don't, I don't, I, I don't read reviews. So okay. I can't no. train my family not to mention reviews. No, it was a terrible show. It really was. And we had a terrible review. Oh, that's so, not go there. Okay. We I'm gotta not, be careful. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You know, I'm I'm very good in the editing room, and I uh, I cut out anything that's that could possibly offend someone that I may want to invite on the show one day. To him, I don't like them, and yeah. I get very angry. 
you know, it can't control me. Yeah, awesome. And obviously you got injured doing Matilda. That that makes you our most injured guest without us ever interviewing a Broadway Spider-Man. Oh, God, that was terrible. Well, the it, children were terrible. They hurt him. It was kind of a bad scene. Yeah. It was, it, well, it, I can't blame anybody. You know, you walk into a system that's already up and functioning, which I'd never done before. Never replace it. I, I have enormous respect for, I mean, actually, in no greater case than uh, in Girl from the North Country because... Because COVID was still happening, every single person in the cast was out at least once, except me. I never got it so far, not got what I never got it. But I did the play with everybody. I mean, we were pulling people out of the audience. Literally, at one point, the lead's husband came in from Connecticut to read the script and play a part because we'd run out of understudies. Mayor Winningham, and she's married to Anthony Edwards, who people will remember from, from among other Man. things. Yeah. yeah. From well, Man. ER, ER. I don't yeah. know his name. No, it's ER. ER, yeah. Dating myself. Yeah. It's gotten physical. I won't lie to you, but... Uh, I don't know that there's any injury. I don't, I don't think I have it up in common with myself to keep dating myself. We'll see how yep. it goes. We'll see. Oh, there you go. Uh, now, before we move on, uh, there's one last thing. Did you know you're an Easter egg in, or Scream 5? I was going to call it 5 Cream because that's what I call it. I just found that out. You just, I, I was so excited. Explain what that means to my mother so she doesn't think I'm an Easter egg because the questions will never stop. An Easter egg is, is like a hidden thing in a film or TV show that might be in the background and it might be a reference to somebody or a previous film or something. So in Scream 5, Craig is listed as playing a character in a film within the movie. So in Scream, which is a series of horror movies, right, I know. Yeah. in the fifth one, I think, what are they up to, six or seven? Where are we at? They've just released the sixth one. So the one released last year. Yeah. Who is in Scream? Courtney Cox. Oh, yes, of course Courtney I know. Yeah. yeah. So know. there's a movie within the movie right. in one of them called Stab. Okay. And there's a quick thing where she's looking. You, I haven't seen it, so you explain it. It shows Craig Bierko as Cotton Weary, which is uh, Leo <laughs> Schreiber's part in the Scream series. Uh-huh. So they've. Oh, that's. Uh, so I, I want to know where he is on the call sheet. I want to know where he is. She wants to know what number I'm listed as because she'll she'll call the pretend producer of Stab and put them out. Yeah. Oh, um, I think you'd probably be about sixth or seventh <laughs> billing. I think. God. That's okay. It's a smallish character. Yeah. Okay. He's an important character. There are no small pretend characters. Yeah, well. Only small pretend actors. That's no. exactly right. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, so while on screaming, we'll move on to the medal. Were you much of a headbanger in the 70s and 80s, Pat? <laughs> For different reasons. Headbanger? I think... uh, no. No. no, that was no. the peppermint lounge kind of. In the seventies and eighties, she was raising my brother Scott and I. Yeah, two I... mastodons. Yeah, and, I... and the seventies this... were not a good time for me. It was a difficult time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was going it... through a terrible divorce. She led the charge of single mothers before everybody was doing it. Was just... You know, I was before kind of the role mom for that part. Yeah, uh, I was first on the call yeah. sheet for that. So, and, and it's not like my brother and I went out of our way to make that easy for her. We were oh. very busy. Doing uh, what, uh, <laughs> very busy doing what, what was 10, 10, 10 to 12. 6, 12 years old do, which is just not help. No. And um, there were car crashes. Yeah, we, were, were, we, were, we, we, we were interesting, but we survived and largely because of this uh, this lady right here to uh, my right. I, honestly, I can trace everything good in my life back to, to, yes, yeah, so you can really use that against me if you want. This is shit. And, and my wonderful stepfather, who's our live studio audience just off screen. Yeah. Uh, Jim, he keeps us all in line now. Keeps us all in line. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know what I would have done, honestly. Uh, even as, as recently as the, what, you know, the delightfully peppy, happy story we started with. It's good to have family who reflect who you actually are and not who you think you are, good or bad, but who you actually are. Keep you in line. Keeps you in line. And that's, I think, I, I it was strange to grow up uh it, it, because really there weren't a lot of parents who were divorced back then it just no. it no. wasn't quite the rage it was no. now so i didn't know how to tell people or talk to people about it and people didn't really know how to deal with me you know and it wasn't it's not like it was such a big deal but i don't know that it was particularly uh you know it, there were aspects of it that any 
the child of divorce would say, oh, you feel bad and it's hard to see your parents go through stuff. I think both of my brother and I needed to, before Jim came along, we needed to sort of assemble a kind of Franken daddy for, you know, male stuff. But my mom, my mom really rose to the occasion. I, I can let you tell the story, but I, I want right. to make sure that I, and then I'll brag about it. Say, well, you say it better than I do. <laughs> I don't know that that's true. I'll say this. My mom went out, and I think at that time in history, and there's nothing wrong with it even now, but to be a housewife, to keep the house running for the family, so we get the kids off to school, keep them fed, you know, keep the machine running, perfectly valid, I mean, necessary. I'm a good mother, you know. But, you know, there was a track everybody was sort of on, which was everybody had the sort of Betty Crocker, Mary Tyler Moore, early 70s haircut, the whole flip pen. And when that picture, changed, that's when you find out who somebody really is. And it was an amazing thing to see, to have objectivity at such a young age and understand something about a parent, an authority figure who you're counting on, who who herself does not have the objectivity to understand how amazing it is. Last night I saw something on TV. This will sound unrelated, but it's not. Tom Cruise, it's a close-up of Tom Cruise, and he's thanking us for some award, and he's telling us what an honor it is to entertain us. And then the camera pulls back, and you realize, he's flying a plane. Oh, he's in a studio, and they're doing it, and they're promoting the movie. And you pull back further, and you realize, he's really flying a jet. And he's speaking into a microphone, and there's another jet flying next to him. And he goes, I'll see you at the movies. And he barrels out to see, and, you, and he's it's real. And you go, God, that's amazing. And that's kind of the feeling I grew up with because I was watching families, you know, the whole unit was together. Yep, nuclear family. As I grew up and as I uh, understood, uh, well, I understood what it was like to be in a relationship and then have one end and how painful that could be. And I wasn't even married you know, uh, just relationships in general, I thought, what if on top of what I'm dealing with now, I had two little, or not little, but we were never little. This is, I was basically born this size. They just unzipped her twice and we walked out. But, uh, <laughs> but, but um, I, you know, looking back, the older I got uh, and the more conscious I got, certainly when I got home from college, I realized my mother was on a track to become, you know, a housewife, take care of the kids, get us to college. And that was the game. And then when my dad left, we had nothing. And I did not know that until I didn't know how much we didn't have until I got out of college. And whatever adolescent narcissism I had had been turned by our educational system into the profession that I'm now in so I could utilize it. And I was no longer simply concerned about myself and at least had the wherewithal to say, how the hell did you do that? And you know what her answer was? It's the most amazing response I ever got. What were my choices? I was like, how long do you have? Do you want me to go alphabetically? <laughs> Queens, which is, you know, different areas. But we used to have a middle class here in America. So we lived in an upper middle class area, not cheap. My mother had no work experience and put herself out into the workforce. Not only that, started working as a clerk at a, a local dinner theater. And then because my mother is such a, everybody loves her as soon as she walks into the room, that make that's the great makings for a salesman. One job led to another. And then she ended up working for company called Dulce International Sales, which was a conference centers all over the world. I became vice president international sales for a conference center hotel resort company. And we had 26 properties all over the world. And um, I was in charge of all the international properties when I left, which was about 13 of them. So it she, was a fantastic career, I it, will say. It, and it was, a, that's the thing is, it was a career and it was started out of necessity. I don't know how much you would enjoy. It's not what you would have gunned for at the beginning. It was out of necessity. Yeah, it was out of necessity. But it was a wonderful career, I have to say, in retrospect. I was exhausted most of the time. But I saw things and did things that I never knew I was capable of. And when I met this wonderful man and decided to get married, I was really in the thrust of this wonderful career. And he was taking care of the world because he was running the social work the world as executive director of the biggest, well, what would you say, Jim, the biggest child welfare yes, agency child welfare agency in New York. And here I come and I said, oh my God, he's saving the world and I'm simply entertaining the world. 
because I had a bunch of people that I was dealing with who were the top executives of every Fortune 500 company. And I had to treat them like they were babes and treat them very, very well to keep them. I'm talking about McKinsey and Company, City Corp, Chase, all of these people that I had to deal with. It was very difficult to get it started, but it, I must say it was very fruitful and was something that I was very proud of at the end. Very hard to leave. That makes me very happy to hear because I grew up watching and when I finally got back from college and I had asked and received the answer and understood wow what an amazing human being you know you don't know if you're going to run into the house and save the cat when the house is on fire you don't know until the house on fire. Now, this was somebody who ran into the house and saved the cat. And while it was happening, and you're the cat, you're just like, well, I'm glad somebody came and got them. I prefer that than option B. When some time passed, and I realized how many burned cats there are out there, how lucky I was. I really did win a lot. My brother and I both, everybody goes through stuff, but we're good people. And that comes from someplace. And I can recognize it in other people. Too. Just this weekend, I told you I was at this Saratoga Horathon. I met some people. I met a girl who was a very talented artist, and she was a fan of scary movies, so she drew the, the guy from Saw for me. But she did it in like 13 seconds. She was 13 years old. And I said, do you know that this is incredible, what you've done? And she goes, well, you know, I like to draw. And I said, no, 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 this is incredible. And I said, do you like all this stuff? And she goes, God, I live for it. And her mother was there too. And her mother was obviously a very good mom, but it was, I think it was just them. So I kind of recognized someone who had a talent, a mother who was nurturing it. They were kind of on their own. And it wasn't like she was good at, I don't know, whatever's going to make you popular. It was this, you know, kind of stuff that not everybody's into. It's very specific. She drew very specific anime. I didn't recognize the style, but I recognized the talent. And I told her mother, I said, you realize that's extraordinary. And she said, yeah. And, and she doesn't always, I said, she's 13. It doesn't matter. She needs to be 13. But what she needs to do is be encouraged. And if you want, and if she wants, I have no problem saying you shouldn't come here next year as a, a guest. You should come here and sit behind a table because that's the little thing that she drew was at least as good as half of the stuff that was there. And these guys were my age and older, you know, craftsmen. So that was really something. That instinct is something I, I think I got from my mom. And this is something I want to say to every single mother who happens to be listening, any single parent, just throw encouragement at your kid and they're going to be okay because the worrying I mean, I, I also saw the, the warrant and you can't take that away. I felt powerless. That was hard. Can't take the worry away, but you can try your best. And I, that seemed tiring. So I wasn't going to try my best. You know, I felt completely supported. And I think that's really all a child needs is that's as good as it gets when, so that when you get up the bat and the pitcher starts throwing the balls and like, you know how to swing and you're not afraid and you believe that you have a right to be up. And both my brother and I have that. And we lead with it. And it's our pleasure to recognize it in, in other people. And I think that comes from somewhere. And, and when I see it in other people, I go, I bet they, they've got at least one good parent. Yeah. That's it. Look, I've been on the receiving end of your support, Craig, plain and simply. You have been extraordinary. You're very much a gentle soul. And I, I'm sure that comes from you, Pat. Now, if we could spoil you in any way, <laughs> if you could pick, what would you put on your ultimate craziest rock star rider? I probably, and this sounds really corny, probably pictures of the entire family. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> how do you how do you argue with that if you're an idiot kid who wants to argue with somebody? Are you talking to me then? <laughs> I, I say that because I did a lot of travel. Yep. And the first thing I did, when I opened my suitcase was, I brought all the pictures with always, was taken out because any salesperson will tell you it's very lonely mm -hmm. when you're traveling and you really want to put something around to say, hey, I'm home. Yep. And especially in a foreign country, which I was all in. And a lot of times I was there for 10 days and my French was, you know, very iffy. And everybody was speaking French, and if I could understand every five words, it was, <laughs> I was doing well, and I was in charge of a lot of money, and I really had to do well. And if I had those pictures with me all the time, I was really very well fortified. So that's, I think, what I was more wow. Yeah. What about a, a sensory with all of them projected all around the room? Big, giant photos. No. That's too much. No. That's, Not too, that's much. too crazy? All right. <laughs> That's all right. 
then I'll start worrying. What's he doing? What's she doing? We're already 10% larger than other people. It, 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 small yeah. pictures are fun. That's it. Uh, anyways, we'll move on to the metal album now, because this week Craig chose the band based on what you had told us last time, that your maiden name or your family name is Distillator. Distillator, yeah. Yes, it is. And that's the name of, well, the former name of a Dutch band, a Dutch metal band. It's crazy. It's really crazy. I can't believe that. Do we know why they're called Distillator or, or what? Because we're not Dutch, are we? No, I think we're Russian, German, Hungarian. And the Distillator has to come from the germ, or gem, we looked it up, or from the... Uh, Story. From the Sears catalog. Yeah, no, probably <laughs> coming over on the boat from Germany or Russia. Coming over. They probably saw a sign that said distill liquor, you know? Well, there are other distillators, but uh, it's not a common name. And her nickname as a kid in camp was Punky. Like Punky Brewster. Oh, I love that. Punky, like Punky Brewster. But, but it's, it was but Punky which, Distillator. Which and is... people still know me as. That is, that's a, can I steal that name please one day for a superhero or something okay punky distillator that is amazing i'm sorry i love it are we gonna we'll have our lawyer just send us your attorney so we can know who to sue can't afford a bloody lawyer craig what is this bush week (laughs) goodness me that's that's a very australian expression for you what is this bush week Bush week. Oh, it's okay. like as if to say, as if, mate, like that's never going to happen. Punky Distillator. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. When I went back to summer camp, yep. because my daughter went to the same summer camp and I would go back to reunion, it was still written on every bunk. What a punky Distillator. Even in the restroom, Punky Distillator. People um, still call me that when I see them. I can't believe there was that much room on the sub. Our, 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 the bunks I went to at camp weren't that big. You know, we wouldn't have been able to fit it. We would have had a right to use in the next bunk. Well, I was team captain. I was the white team captain. She you was know. the captain of the white team. Was the green team and the white team. The white team. Yeah. And I even had a song. Please. That's you right. I used to sing it when I came into the room. I did? What was the song? I don't remember the song. See? What is I it? I don't remember the song. What was the fight song, Mom? Squares is that? Come I don't on, remember no. it either. I don't remember it either. Oh, okay. Well, I, I would say it if I knew it. So didn't your didn't your mom call say it would correct okay. people say no? It's it's distillateur. Distillateur. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I, I'm, I am absolutely living for that name. And it's better than what they changed their name to, which would be Cryptosis. So Punky Cryptosis. No. Oh, God. That doesn't work. That, that's a villain. That doesn't work. Why, why did they do that? Did they change members or something? That's what happened to us. I have no idea. It's only new. Okay. It's, it's only the past couple of years, I believe. Okay. Because they're not too big. I sent away for distillator t-shirts and I never got them. We think they got to the wrong, sent to the wrong office. I'm still, I'm hoping I can find some. But that might be why, because now they're cryptosis. We don't want cryptosis no. t-shirts. No. It sounds like we don't want cryptosis. I hope we cure that. It sounds like a disease. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a disease. Cryptosis sounds like death. Yeah. He's got cryptosis. That's, you don't come back from cryptosis. Yeah, that's, that's a villain name, Punky Cryptosis. Versus Punky Distillator <laughs> is is the hero. Punky Distillator is delightful, isn't it? That, that, I'm <laughs> absolutely living. Um, yeah, but uh, anyways, about this band, they're quite fun. They're dark. They're anti-fascist. It's very much a romp through neck pain country. The drums are very very unrelenting. That voice, like how tight is his underwear? I have no idea. Or he must be like. <laughs> or something like that. I tried hitting well, at least one of those notes, but I couldn't. It was ridiculous. No, there's no reason uh, you should. It would require surgery. Yeah. Um. So, like, I kind of really dug it because it's this wow, wee, woo voice against the which isn't really my type of music, but it was just so wacky and crazy. But anyways, it looks like we're gonna distill sooner, not <laughs> distill later. So we're gonna go to a neck break. <laughs> Hey there, it's time to get Popped on Culture, the official Puzzle Hub pop quiz podcast. And welcome to game number five. I'm your new host, Matt Young. And for today's special theme, we're going to test your knowledge on musical groups, including bands, boy bands, girl groups, and vocal ensembles. Play against your friends or the clock and see how you go. 
All right, let's get into it, shall we? Next up, we've got our pop quiz. 10 trivia questions based on today's theme, and maybe a few bonus points if you're lucky. You'll have five seconds to guess the answer. So, ready for question number one? Zach, Taylor, and Isaac are members of which group? Anson. Of course, they're famous for Mbop. Crash test dummies were formed in which country? Canada, or as I like to say, Canadia. Third question. Finish this album title. Never mind the bollocks. Here's the... The answer is Sex Pistols. The album is the 2020 debut album by which K-pop group? Blackpink. Jada Pickett Smith performs lead vocals for which metal band? Wicked Wisdom. Said and Done was the 1995 debut album by which boy band? Boys are. Seventh question. According to Wikipedia, the Beatles were the last band to top the U.S. Billboard end-of-year album charts. In which year did they achieve this? 2001. Which three opera singers made up the operatic supergroup The Three Tenors? One point for each correct answer. It was Placido Domingo, Jose Carreras, and Luciano Pavarotti. Are you ready for this one? Mesopotamia, Funplex, and Rock Lobster are hits by which band? The B-52s. And finally, in which year did ABBA form? 1972. You, I mean, I know you like Broadway things, you like show music, but when you listen to uh, regular music that isn't show music, what do you tend to like? Um, who, do you, who do you listen to? When it comes to like rock or metal and stuff, I like punk, and that can be quite thrash and very, mm -hmm. very, very thrash and very screamy and all that. But I like a lot of melodic punk or disco infused punk and stuff like that. Um, but I love my mm. divas. I love Madonna and Kelly Clarkson and Patsy Cline. Oh, my God, I love Patsy Cline. I love Patsy mm. More female vocalists, which is funny because I don't really like romantic songs and I don't like romantic comedies or romantic movies. I love action movies and horror movies, like real. When it comes to music, I'm like, divas, yay, women. Yeah. When it yeah. comes to movies, I'm like, yeah, go punch each other up. I don't know why. It's this weird juxtaposition. Well, they're both outsized. Like, they're almost exaggerations of the actual experience. Like, horror movies are exaggerated. And divas are, they're almost drag acts of themselves. Yes. Right? They're, I mean... Who's funnier than Bette Midler? And I kind of feel like she's camping up. She camps herself. You know, it's like she's doing herself, you know, but she's brilliant. Oh, yeah. Bette Midler is a drag queen. So is Dolly Parton as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very strong, outsized personality. Yeah. And then, you know, who's also uh, you should speak to who's hilarious. Beverly D'Angelo, the actress Beverly D'Angelo. Oh, my. Who played in the, at the Patsy Cline movie. Tammy Wynette. Was it Tammy Wynette? Who did she play? What? Spacek, I don't know. Was it Sissy Spacek? Who's? Uh, I can't. Are you thinking Coal Miner's daughter? Yes, yes Coal Miner's daughter. daughter. That was Sissy Spacek. That was Loretta Lynn, wasn't it? Loretta. Yeah. Lynn. Yeah. But that Sissy Spacek uh, played her. Really, I would love to to talk to Beverly D'Angelo. Um. I grew up watching Hair, like a little kid, five-year-old watching Hair, the movie. So Beverly Jandra, I love her. Yeah. That's that's the sort of, like I grew up with Rocky Horror and Grease and a lot of sort of 
rock musicals more than I did classical. Um, mm-hmm. That was more sort of things like Mary Poppins or Wizard of Oz. But yeah, it's sort of, it's weird that, as I say, like it's a juxtaposition. I love all these high octane action movies, but then the music, I, I love my divas and I don't listen to too many male vocalists. It's just a matter of taste. Yeah. You know, I listen to people who sing things that I might be able to sing if I'm listening. I've, I'm a baritone, so in rock and roll, it slims everything down a lot. Mm-hmm. You just lost Gordon Lightfoot. That's like half my repertoire right there. You know, I love yeah. If You Could Read My Mind. I love that song. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I talk about not liking love songs, but I love that song. Yeah, yeah. Troubadour. What do you listen to, Pat? I like country. You like country? I like country. Yeah, I like country. Yeah. yeah. But you listen to a lot of show music when you... I like show, too. Yeah. yeah I love show. We grew up with yeah. that. Well... I did. Yeah. And, and my mom's, my grandfather, was a very talented pianist, among other things, very talented businessman, but he could just sit down at the piano. Yeah, and play. play by you. He so he took it. you to all the Broadway all shows. Of the, you know, original, you know, Gertrude Lawrence in uh, The King and I. Wow. Um, you know, the original My Fair Lady. She yeah. saw Robert Preston in the music. Now. Yeah, I saw Robert Preston. Oh, wow. And then you got to see Hugh Jackman in it, did you? <laughs> no, okay. You got to see, obviously, Craig do it in the year 2000. Well, I saw that 35 times. Wow. Yeah. She did. Right. She was, until recently, in touch with uh, the, ushers. the ushers. She would write Christmas cards. Yeah, because I brought them food also. Be nice to my son. Please. Yeah, my mom was there. My mom, <laughs> if somebody got hurt, my mom was ready to go. Right. Was ready. Well, that was Adeline. That's right. That's right. Oh, oh, that is so rock and roll. You found a, you found a picture. Oh yeah, from, uh, um, from Gypsy. Yes. That, yeah. The Zephyr. That Zephyr. was some good research. Yes. Yeah. The Zephyr. Because yes. we've been looking. We I have a picture. picture. We have a picture close of her in that. Yeah, you know, hat. Like a Roman helmet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I don't, we I don't can't know. find it. And Lost you actually found it. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. just on their website. It wasn't all that deeper research. It was there. I, so I just, it, it, most theater companies have a history. And if you just go to the history, quite often there is photos of as as whatever they can find, basically. Right. Right. There's usually not much, but I, I was actually I was pleasantly surprised to I sort of recognized the the three strippers and I was like, that must be gypsy. Yeah. And it was. And it was hilarious. So it was really great to grow up. That was my first ex- the first shows I saw, I was watching my parents and even before I went to see anything on Broadway. Pippen, yeah. And then we went to see uh, <laughs> Pippin for my brother's was it his tenth birthday? Tenth birthday. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And I said, What is this play about? Yeah, and she said, uh, my mom said, I think, I, like I think you'll like it. It's medieval time kings. And I was like, Can yeah, I stay in the car? I wanted to wait in the car. <laughs> I was like, maybe I'll wait in the car. Why don't you come and give it a try? Yeah. And the second it started. And that was it. That's uh, what I wanted to do. Ben Vereen comes out. And I was like, that's the coolest human being I've ever seen in my life. The way he was moving, he was dressed all in black, yeah. you know, black beard. And he was just, he looked so cool. And then the women came out. And this was directed by Bob Fosse. That was the night my entire system booted up. Yep. I lit up like Las Vegas. Every gland in my body. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. The Fosse production that we saw was actually quite dark. Yeah, I never the, saw it again. Ever. No, and they never did it quite that way again. And every other musical I ever saw or did afterwards had to answer to Pippin. Yeah. Because it stripped all the illusion away. And they end up alone on stage without, remember, spoiler alert. And that was, you know, another great gift. You know, uh, what would have happened to me had I had I stayed in the car? God only knows what would have happened to me. I'd be working at that garage today. I'd be parking cars there today. Yeah. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with parking cars to anyone listening that may park <laughs> cars for a living. And not but, that it's out of the question. But I know what that's like to be a pubescent teenager or you know 12 13 years old to be taken to a musical that you know nothing about and the lights come up and the curtain rises and there's all these skimpy prostitutes hanging over the bar doing hey big spender because my mum took me to see sweet charity and we had no idea what it was about yeah and that was a very eye-opening experience for a little well yeah i was about 13 years old or something like that um but anyways we'll move on it was nice to see that the harrison plays are still going yeah do you still go down there and and join in yeah. no i've never i haven't gone down there yeah I, I you know what i don't like to go back places a lot yeah i know that feeling it's like going back to a you know it's why boyfriend. I- 
it's why you know yeah. people would ask me did you go see the new music man and i could i could, I, I couldn't <laughs> i think it was probably for different reasons but i couldn't because it just was such a special experience yeah. and now that we lost for that stuff, i, I no, can't no, even no, imagine no, no. yeah that's all right yeah um, there's actually going to be a, a concert. Yes. The Rebecca Lucas songbook coming up. And there are all kinds of funds. And I will send oh. you information. So we can put that on the web page. Uh, now, move on to the musical, because this week we chose Mame. We chose it for a, a personal reason that you had mentioned, Craig. Now, this is actually, I didn't realize, very personal to me, because I've raised my nephew for the past 13 years. He was left here as a five-month-year-old. So I stepped up. Because my parents, my dad's 82, my mum's 75. They don't need to be raising another child. They don't need to be going through another teenager. Oh, God. So I stayed around and that's what I always wanted to be was the kooky auntie that would always take him on crazy adventures. And yeah. I have gotten to, I've, <laughs> I've taken him, uh, we went to Sydney and did Supernova where we were hanging out with people like, Billy West. Billy West does the voice of the Eminem, the red Eminem on TV. Yeah. I think other than a lot of stuff, doesn't he? Yeah, he does Futurama. So there's some crossover because I think Billy West was a guest on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast. Yes. So now we've got crossover. The metaverse. We're building our own metaverse. We are. And, and I'm suddenly the new Kevin Bacon because I'm like connected to everybody in Hollywood now. <laughs> like, oh my goodness yeah. me. It's not a bad um, position to be in. No, it's not. Like, Jason Isaacs was there, Lucius Malfoy from Harry Potter. There were sort of all these really, you know, iconic people there. And he was six years old, and we're riding the bus with these people because we were there as guests. It was called Supernova? What is that? That's a, a fan convention. Comic-Con. It's re- yeah. like a Comic-Con. Yeah. yeah, basically. Okay. Like, we did that. We took him to Disneyland a few months later. We took him to Hawaii, and I took him to the Valley of Jurassic Park, and I dress up throw in big you know fancy parties dress up parties and stuff like that and I, I would always just try to keep things really fun and interesting for him so when I realized what this was about I sort of thought well, th- what a beautiful choice because not only do we have you on here Pat so I've got you know a, a legendary guest returning with his own mum <laughs> but we're celebrating a story here that like Mother's Day it, to me is more me than Father's Day I'm more feminine than right. I am masculine. So, you know, happy Mother's Day to me, basically. Uh, every year. <laughs> That's really something uh, I didn't know that you hadn't mentioned that. And on top of everything, because I know you're like everybody, you're, you're dealing with, with a lot of stuff. And, and uh, we all are. And to take on mm-hmm. raising or, or even being a parental figure in any way uh, to being a mentor. Somebody had mentioned that this weekend to me at the convention. They were a mentor and they... I was talking to somebody next to me and they were listening to the conversation. I said, do either of you mentor anybody? Because uh, they knew that neither of us had, had children. And I said, no. A couple of years ago, I, there was a young actor who, you know, I, I helped sort of figure some stuff out, you know. But uh, other than that, never. And, and so he said, you should look into it. Gave us the name of a specific program. Because that sounds like it's really enriching for you, too, you know. Being a single gay man, I wasn't allowed by the government to adopt him. Really? Yeah, because of, you know, bullshit rules. Is that still the case? Yeah, that's still the case. If I was in a relationship, that would be different. But because I'm single, I was never allowed to adopt him. So he had no choice but to co-raise him with them. But then it became a matter of two very different generations. My dad was raised with a British naval father. So he's got that sort of attitude about his parenting. Whereas I'm a lot more liberal. I'm a lot more, you know, kooky and crazy and stuff. So there's been a lot of clashing over the years. So yeah, it's a tough situation. I would imagine. But you know what? It's also a 13 year old's job is to make life difficult for the parent. That's yeah. And they're being narcissistic. They're figuring stuff out. Everything's changing on the inside. Mm -hmm. Systems booting up. It's a difficult time. It's, if it's, it's prodigal. Like I said, I, I didn't understand that I was even curious about how I managed to stay in a, in a nice neighborhood with my friends, a great school, and then be put through college and then realize because I had a, a mom who said, what choice did I have? 
And you know what? Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last show. I read an interview. I'm not a big sports guy, but I did read an interview with Michael Jordan once. Did I mention this last time? I don't know if I did. I don't think so, no. Michael Jordan helped me understand my mom. I was reading the interview, and the interviewer said, now human beings can't fly. They can't, not by themselves. And yet, you probably come the closest because you seem to fly across the court and dunk the ball. It, how, what is how do what is going on in your brain? And no one had ever quite asked him that before. They just always assumed, well, you know, special athlete, you know. And he said, I can't explain it. All I can tell you is I've made that basket before I jump. It's dirty dunk. And it was called another friend who had read that said, yeah, this is called super star. It's very rare, but it's everybody has access to it, but you have to be able to back it up with action. Uh, and of course you have to practice. It's not just that, but it's a different way of thinking. It's already done. And I think that's what I heard with what choice did I have? It was already done. And I think back on my life and, you know, we all went through stuff. It was, it, it's hard to see your parent go through a difficult time to go through a sadness and to have to readjust. And then really it's, it's on your behalf, a lot of it. And you can only help so much. I say this, like, I listen, I, I didn't move dishes from the sink to the dishwasher, but I'm hoping by next week I learned to do that. But so I, maybe emotionally, but I was I was certainly fulfilling my obligation as a, a lay about 13 year old. And um, I was the benefit of superstar thinking. That's really what it was. Michael Jordan and my mother. And I don't know too many others. And you, that superstar thinking. Well, it's, it's not because it's what choice did i have that's it it's either i stay and help them or i move out and and leave like you know what i mean like it it was what choice to like grew up in my situation you know uh, who were divorced in that who grew up with children divorced in that era there may have been a seismic quake fault line through their entire life because they were uprooted and moved my mom didn't want that to happen knew how special our friendships were at school and to keep the continuity because that was something she had as a child she wanted us to have that but the difference was she you grew up in a very you were very wealthy we were not and um i wasn't aware we really weren't supposed to be there we we're there because it was already taken it was done i still don't really understand yeah but i'm grateful it's the tenacity of humans that's what it is. Just a couple of things on a meme, and I'll, I'll get into what it means to you guys. Uh, the Michael at the end of it, the the little boy that goes to live with her at the very, very end. That man grew up to be Dr. Michael Tanner, who actually plays the saxophone on the In Trousers recording. So you know the musical falsettos, Craig? Yeah. That's um, William Finn. Yeah. The first part of that is In Trousers, that Alison Frazier yeah. was her professional break, right? The saxophonist is Michael Tanner, that is Auntie Mame's great nephew. Oh, oh, that's fantastic. The child at the end. Yeah. Not Patrick. Not Patrick. Patrick's son. Oh, that's so great. I love that. Isn't that a, just a weird connection? Yeah. Serendipity. Serendipity, that's it. Yeah. Um, Alison told us the first time she was on, and it sort of always stuck out in my memory, so I've been waiting to do MAME. I don't do that play very much. No. 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 No, no. What? They haven't brought that back in a long time. I wonder why. I think it's very hard to get that character. Yeah, that's a special person. Oh, We're waiting five years for Sutton Foster to play, right? Or ten years. Probably, yeah. yeah. I think she'd be great yeah. as Mae or Vero. Yeah. Sutton Foster. She's so funny. Her. But she's she wasn't right for Oh, I don't know. I didn't she? see I did, we didn't see it. So I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> she's extremely talented. No, I know she is, but she's so different from Rebecca. Well, that is true. Well, it was and she was different from me. Every production is going to be different. And my big brother, Scott, played it differently when he did it in the fifth grade. Oh, wow. Yeah. They did the whole play. And he did it. And then he did it again. He did it again after I did it. Right? In the dinner theater. Yeah. Yeah. That play runs through our family. Goodness me. I had no idea. Well, we chose this one, um, obviously, because we'd done The Music Man last time. I believe that one of the songs in this show is is your song that you two used to sing to each other. Oh, yeah. My best girl. My yes. best girl. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yeah. I, I won't ask you. You're though. my best girl, and nothing you do is wrong. I'm so proud you belong to me. And if the day is rough for me, having you there is enough for me. 
And if someday some other bow comes along, it won't take him long to see that I, what was it? That I'll still be home. That I'm, well, uh, I, uh, I should have, I, I should have prepared, but I can be found hanging around my best girl. Dang. That's the unwarmed up version of it. Yeah. And you can, and that can be listened to in any key. Yeah. I sang it in every key. <laughs> yeah. I can, yeah. I can put some auto tune on that, um, but you won't be getting a standing ovation today. Uh, or I'll can you send you a better version. Uh, I'll, it's all good. A, I'll do anything for this one. Even sing off key. But, uh, <laughs> well, yes, I gave, I found uh, a keychain. Uh, a, a key chain. We need to replace it. No, I Oh, a lovely little uh, years ago. I, I found in uh, Tiffany. No, it was in South. It was in uh, uh, South Africa, wasn't it? Or was it Tiffany? It was I might have found the heart there and then had it. Oh, something it else in South Africa. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. We got you yeah. something out. Yes, I was it Tiffany. Oh boy, good for me. Yeah. There's a good boy. Yeah, a little heart a bracelet with a chain. Yeah, that says, says my, my best you're my best girl. Oh, yeah. lovely. My best gal. Goodness me. Uh, look, I'd never heard it. I knew we need a little Christmas. Oh, yeah. Because it's a standard now. Even Robert took a small part in that. That's right. I that really is. love that. Yeah. That yeah. he took a small part in that after music. Yeah, he did that a bunch of times, I think. He was just, uh... oh, it's a beautiful song. It's a beautiful song. Uh, what was the other one? I knew the, the main song, Mame, from Connie and Carla. Oh. Tony Collette, Nia Vardalos movie about drag queens. So it turns out drag is also educational, people. Oh, it's, are they being ridiculous? There too. Are they doing so, that? The whole oh, thing with drag, teach, drag and storytelling, like that's all of a sudden. Oh, yeah. that's a that's jerk. That's uh, drag queens raised me, and I am perfectly well adjusted. Believes nobody. Is that right? Oh, look, I grew up watching Rocky Horror. That's one thing. Tim Curry in, in drag. And Priscilla? Yeah, Priscilla. I was nine or something when I saw it at the movies with my mum. Mrs. Doubtfire, I was seven when I saw that. I grew up with right. Day Medna, Julian Clary, Eddie Izzard. <laughs> oh. Pantomime. Bugger off, people. I, you know, I'm going to say uh, condolences to your... Condolences to... Uh, all of Australia and and anybody who loves anybody brilliant on Barry Humphreys who created Dame Edna and I know there's some controversy there. Yeah, I know he said some things that were uh, unfortunate, um, but uh, you know I, I also I, I it, this world gets a little we get so crazy with the cancellation that um, there, there'd be nobody to enjoy it tore everybody apart for what we you know we well, don't the have the is horrible. well that that you know yeah. aside from <laughs> actual horrible people i i didn't <laughs> i didn't get that i did i didn't get the sense that i mean you know what it sounded like an opinion that was of its time he's of another time perhaps and and i don't know i don't know what his i don't know anything about him really uh, and uh, other i mainly knew damon which was a huge fan of, took a girlfriend of mine at the time to see and we were the couple that he chose to bring up and make fun of mm -hmm. and he predicted that we weren't going to make it and we didn't he was brilliant and my condolences because i thought he was brilliant and i'm sorry for some unfortunate uh, points of view but mm. those points of view were quite literally dying out yes we're dealing with the same thing over here it's yeah. just a nausea it's unfortunate but we'll, we'll all we're, we're we all stick together yeah. Oh, look, I, as I've said on this show before, when I was seven years old, I would dress up in dresses and wigs in class and play the evil witch or the yeah. evil queen in, you know, little plays that we would put on. And yeah, I would get picked on for it and spat on and pushed and kicked and called a little girl and stuff. Now as an adult, I sit back and I watch the little kids that are doing that are now getting picked on by adults. Mm. Not just by kids their own age, like I did. It's adults that are calling them disgusting yeah. and yeah. freaks and stuck, yeah. and stuff like that. And just grow up. It's happening here. Yeah. It's happening all over the world. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, we'll, we'll move on. It looks like we've been maimed by a kooky aunt again. So we're going to fly to the moon. Yeah. 
G'day listeners, Aaron here. While you're topping up your coffees, did you know that you can support our show and go on a fantastically scary adventure at the same time? Go to www.thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore to grab your copy of The Toniston Tales, a darkly funny Aussie trilogy about a young boy who rescues injured animals in his spare time and the roller coaster ride he's taken on by a literal fish out of water. Written by me, the village idiot of Thrash and Treasure, you'll come to love Toniston Turnbull and the dozens of wacky characters that he meets along the way. And here is a sneak peek. Landing with a thud that echoes throughout the whole cottage, Toniston instantly rips off the manky shoes gifted to him by Milford and tosses them into the corner behind a blue barrel. Without a second thought, the bully races down the hallway to the backmost room of the house and leaps behind his uncomfortable makeshift hay bed, then waits, and waits, and then waits some more, until finally, what seems like an eternity later, muffled growls start vibrating through the thin walls of Cubpaw's cottage. He tries to control his breathing, but his heart is racing way too fast. Toniston ducks down further. Nothing should be able to see him, but he can't be sure they won't smell him. The gruff growling grows louder. Toniston presses his ear against the cold, chipped, chalky wall. He thinks he can make out phrases like, Where is it? And, Give us the merge, though not much else. It's all too mumbled, and he's shaking too much. But it doesn't matter anymore. The front door of the cottage slams open with a harder, louder, cracking thud than it ever had before. A dozen or so stomping footsteps enter. The cottage shakes uncontrollably as if it is as terrified as our friend the bully is. Toniston panics. He's trapped in a corner with a slew of sharks on his trail. He makes a sudden rash decision. Ripping aside the thick animal hide curtain, Toniston leaps through the small oval-shaped window headfirst, landing on a crate filled with hay sitting outside it. Mustering every ounce of manliness he has not to react verbally as he lands with a crunch on the sharp, pin-like hay. It pierces his skin in several places, but thankfully, in his panicked state, the bully becomes numb to the pain. Counting his blessings, but not his chickens, Toniston struggles out of the crate by throwing his legs over and levering himself up, causing the coral underneath his feet to snap. He loses balance and tumbles. To describe the pain of tumbling face first down a steep hill of hard, sharp, deadly shaped coral would require far too many swear words than this author would be allowed to publish. So let's just say it hurt a lot. With one last somersault, Toniston's legs fly first over the cliff's edge. Crunch. His left hand grabs hold of the outmost jagged knob of coral. The stocky body of the ten-year-old child sways rapidly back and forth like some sort of death-defying pendulum. He gasps for air, or from shock, not even Toniston can tell. All he knows is above him, a deadly coral cliff and deadlier sharks. Below him, larger, sharper coral under a sea of giant, sharp spikes of natural metal. His head throbbing and vision too blurred with bright red splotches to be able to see clearly for too long. His face is dripping with blood. It runs down his shirt front, tickling him in the process. But all he can do is swing there. It's moments like these that a boy really needs his mum. Unfortunately, while Toniston's life hangs in the balance, on earth his life was dishonestly being celebrated by all at Gumbaya Primary School after news of the bully's disappearance had spread like wildfire through the tiny town, then onto the music industry before eventually reaching the wider world. Rock music fans, specifically those of Muzzletop, had flocked to the outskirts of Melbourne, leaving wreaths, band posters and hand-drawn tributes to honour the missing son of their favourite singer. Although none of them knew the boy, many had seen him standing on the side of the stage of the band's concerts alongside Tina. Also, at the time of his disappearance, hundreds of the world's entertainment media lined the streets outside the school and sadly outside Tina's house. Wanting any word they could get their greasy hands on, the gossip came in thick and fast as snide, bored neighbours took it upon themselves to speculate and make up stories for their five minutes of fame. Inside the house, the phone ringing 10, 15 times a day from nosy TV stations, hounding the poor, terrified mother, there was no escape. 
and whilst Tina was never polite in her declination, still they persisted. Call me again and I'll punch you in the nose, she promised. The school's principal, Mr. Patterson, had himself realised how cold and nasty it would look if Toniston Turnbull's former victims didn't at least pretend to mourn his disappearance. And thus, with an added paranoia of becoming a suspect, Mr. Patterson set out to overcompensate with memorials and dedications to the boy who touched all our lives with his love of animals. Mr. Patterson felt satisfied his school's image was intact. The largest memorial from the school came in the form of a service in the gymnasium. With every student, teacher, news reporter and local police in attendance, Mr. Patterson sought to show the world just how much Toniston had meant to the school. The service would have made the bully puke. From the awful school choir butchering his least favourite songs to the obnoxious releasing of the white doves, Mr. Patterson may have been satisfied his memorial service paid tribute, but Toniston is far too cynical for that. And yet, whilst hundreds of people sat on the cold plastic seats in the Gumbaya Primary School Auditorium, not one person in attendance truly knew Toniston when he was around. But all alone, in her large house, the animals all shunned outside, Tina Turnbull sits with her umpteenth glass of wine, ignoring the umpteenth phone call from friends, fans and family, but most sad of all, wondering, for the umpteenth time, what she could have said to her only child to have brought the two of them closer together. A now broken photo of Trent Turnbull and an infant Toniston only hours after his birth sits at her feet under the table. Tina simply doesn't care about the million tiny shards of glass cutting up her feet. She just wants her son back. And as if joined at the soul, while dangling from the lavender-coloured dead coral cliff face, somewhere in his head voice, Tina's cries are heard by the boy. His face scrunches up, but then it relaxes. I can do this. Grab your copy of The Toniston Tales from thetonistontales.com forward slash bookstore today. Hooroo! All right, we're back with Thrush and Treasure. I'm Aaron, that's Craig Bioko, and we are joined by his mum for Mother's Day. It's Pat Campbell. And I've just got a few questions on raising Craig and what that was like. So what was the most adorable thing Craig did as a child? I can see Craig's going red. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't so adorable. No, you were. <laughs> you were the most adorable. He wasn't so little. It was just very, very nice. I was all alone in the very beginning for New Year's Eve. And he always used to come home from a party or wherever a day and just come home and say New Year's and then go out again. Or I would come home with my friends. If, if one of my friends had broken up with a girlfriend, I brought them home and I, it was not uncommon. It would be three o'clock in the morning and I'd come home from a party with a friend of mine and my mom would be sitting there talking to my friend about it's going to be okay about the breakup. And anyone who was my friend, she, and to this day, thinks I was part of the family as as a kid. And they loved it. Our Thanksgiving and Christmas, we had a huge long table. And everybody who had no place to go was always at our house. Yeah. Probably. Alternatively, now, Craig, what was the naughtiest you were as a child? As a preteen, not as a teenager, because then we can deal with like the cops and stuff like that. So the, as a as a preteen, what was the naughtiest you were? Preteen, I can think of teen. Uh, preteen, I, I mean, I'm sure I, uh, yeah. I know, I don't remember what it was, but I once received what I still feel like is, I should. T- it's probably past the statute of limitations. It was it was a long time ago, but uh, the the Brady Bunch and the Partridge Family used to be on. I think it was Friday nights, and I, whatever I did, I lost a month of television, which was huge, and five weeks of the Partridge Family. It was so bad that they added on an extra week of no Partridge Family because that was. I was in love with Shirley yep. Jones. Oh, and why not? I was in love with her. My very crush. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it wasn't Susan Day. It wasn't. It was Shirley was Jones. No, and then it wasn't. It wasn't Marsha Brady, which what do you think would have been the logical choice? But uh, no, I was in love with Shirley Jones, and I thankfully I got to tell her that. Yeah, right. <laughs> She came to see the music band, and it was wonderful. Of course, yeah, she was in it. Eric Vitro, who's a wonderful uh, vocal teacher in Los Angeles, 
And I walked in and she was just finishing her lesson. And uh, I got to tell her that she was the, the love of my life. And I don't think it's a good time for us to begin anything now. Oh. <laughs> I'm off to do some work. But, uh, and you know who else came backstage was um, uh, Sheila McRae. Sheila McRae I met. She was very complimentary. Oh, a lot. I met a lot of people that uh, some of that I can't remember. But uh, Mel Brooks kissed me on the lips. Oh, wow. And Anne anyway, anyway, Bancroft was his, her, her, uh, her I do run out of the play. Run of the play. Yeah, I said, you're run of the play, run of the play, which is just, you know. No, crazy. but you said, um, when I came back, you said, I'm standing here in my underwear with the Mrs. Robinson. I can't believe I'm standing <laughs> here in my underwear with Mrs. Robinson and, and, and Mel Brooks at the same time. Yeah, it was a magical time. I mean, I met so many of my heroes. Warren Beatty, oh. who couldn't have been nicer. Uh, and Matt Benning okay. and uh, Kevin Klein, who came to see the show twice. He's just one uh, absolute hero. If I'd known he was in the audience the first time, I would have thrown up. Yeah, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks sent a beautiful note back. Uh, yeah, it was a magical, magical, wonderful, time. wonderful. Time. But I, I'm skirting the issue. You are skirting the issue. Yep. I am. I, this is what I do. <laughs> um, I don't know that it was miss. It, it, there was never anything on purpose. I, whatever it was, I, I was certainly punished. I did something wrong. I used, you know, what I used to do a lot, and I don't know where this came from, but uh, I used to have what my dad would call upstairs toys. Oh. A lot of action figures, a lot. Anytime with a GI Joe, and the GI Joes used to have some heft, you know. And anytime a new figure came out, and they so they had the evil Knievel, where you could crank up his motorcycle and he would jump over things. And there was one called Big Jim who could flex his muscles. I remember I was driving somewhere with my dad. We walked into a store, and I said, "Can we get this?" He goes. What does this one do? Fart? <laughs> and the whole door started laughing because it was funny. My dad was a very funny guy. Very cruel. And cool. He was a cruel <laughs> funny man. <laughs> but when he was funny, he was funny. I think the, the naughtiest thing I did, it seems funny in retrospect, but it wasn't that night. I had a horrible, horrible crush. Since the fifth grade, I'll say her name. I'll give her a shout out. Heather Welch moved yeah. up from Knoxville, Tennessee in the fifth grade. And I... I, I I was I was mesmerized from the first second, and she had this cute southern accent. Always a little too nervous to say anything. I was very uh, shy around the girl. So that was a fifth grade. When I was a senior in high school, and this first time had a real slow process. I had finally become friends enough with her that I could somehow justify. I knew her parents weren't home. I don't think it was a school night, but it might have been. So I thought, you know, it would be funny. I got two wine glasses and a bottle of Pepsi, Pepsi Light. And and I slowly, we, we had a, a garage door that sounded like thunder whenever you get like, I opened the garage very slowly. Yeah. And then I put the car in neutral and pushed it along the driveway. And then I started it as far away from the house as I could. It must have been like 10 o'clock at night. And I went over to Heather's and we toasted with, you know, and we sat there all night. Nothing happened because I was too shy and whatever. But we talked for a couple of hours. And when I got home, the garage door had been closed. I walked into the house and my mother was standing at the top of the stairs. And I'd never seen... I don't know that I had ever, I, I know that I made my mother angry before, but this was bad because I, I think I had, I had done something dangerous. This was the family car. I think I had my license, but I might've just had my learner's permit. I don't remember. I, it was all bad. There wasn't any punishment. I think you knew knowing I disappointed my mother was punishment enough. That's the one that I, that's the one that I remember. It was funny to me. And then I remember how awful it felt that because she, the car was gone and she had to wait for a couple of hours, not knowing what could happen. So that that's that was kind of naughty. But I, I don't know that I've ever have I ever you, tell me if I'm missing. No, I can't. Something. I can't remember. Yeah, Heather, if you're listening. <laughs> for that one. <laughs> now, Pat, what has been your favorite of Craig's film or TV or theater that he's done? You have to know the music man has to be the favorite. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Actually, I watched a bootleg of that. Oh, they have. There is. There's an entire. It's an entirety, isn't? It? Yeah, it's terrible quality, but I watched it. Free iPhone. Yeah, I have a lot of a lot of it, but not. The but whole someone thing. take the entire show. So yeah. Where do we get that? Well, the thing is, if you're ever in New York, we can, can, can do Lincoln this. Center. Yeah, and if, if the I, Lincoln, the you can go to the Lincoln Center, Lincoln Center, and they started taping uh, every Broadway show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. 
Unfortunately, after Pippin, because I would have loved to have seen Pippin, it's too bad that an actual tape of that doesn't exist because it was brilliant. Shortly after that, in the 70s, they started taping yeah. everything. And you can go to the, uh, to the library at Lincoln Center. You just have to make a reservation. You sit down at a study carol. Oh, did you know that? Yeah. You can just watch... Watch them, watch them oh. all. It's all. I, I, I love that. I want to. Like I've never been to New York. There's so many Broadway shows I want to see, and we don't get a lot of transfers over here. So you're. Now, what do you think of uh, the actors over there? I um, mean, like, well, we love uh, Nicole Kidman. Oh uh, yeah, we love her, Nicole. We have a very small industry here. Most of our actors end up going overseas because there's just not the work here. I know. I guess you're mad about uh, Russell Crowe. Yeah. And he actually started in musical theatre. He started off in Rocky Horror in the 80s. Oh, did he? Yeah. I know he was a singer. He made albums, right? Yeah. He's got a a rock band. Every time I see somebody I like and they start talking, they're Australian. Yep. That's usually the way. A lot of movie stars are. Yes. Yeah. We talked about this recently because we had an Australian on who had done a Hollywood film in 2000, back when Australians had to get invited to Hollywood. Oh, really? It wasn't a thing of we would just get on a plane and we would arrive in New York or Hollywood fresh off the bus. Hello, world, here I am. No, we that wasn't an option for us in the 90s. Well, up until the 2000s, really, once the, the floodgates opened up. Back then, it was you had to do something of value or that got noticed overseas, like Priscilla or Muriel's Wedding, and then you got invited over to Hollywood. So okay, that's why over the past 20 years, there has been more and more and more. Nowadays, they'll just... Really, they only need 20,000 followers on Instagram and a month on a soap opera, and that's it. They think they're famous enough to go to America, and yeah, I don't know if every American enjoys it, but anyways, just got a few more questions, and then we won't keep you any longer, because obviously it's- We're enjoying this, so take your time. Yeah, there's no rush. Awesome. There's a few more ones that might make your face turn red, Craig. What was the most (laughs) traumatizing outfit that Pat put you in when you were a child? Or haircut, or haircut, because, oh my God, traumatizing haircuts as a child. No, no, I still. Uh, I, I, that I have to say, my parents, you know, it was of its time. There are pictures of me in the second grade wearing purple bell bottom pants. I mean, you know, a non ironically groovy stuff. So there was one outfit, and I have to say it was my grandmother, who I love very much, my Nana Stephanie, who was dad's mom, saw something in the JCPenney catalog was there was a point where men were wearing one piece jumpsuit it was hideous it was like a brown corduroy thing and it had a zip up front it looked like something that one of the charlie's angels would have worn but it was for a, she saw it and there was a drawing or something from jc penny and she thought it was great she's gonna go get her grandkids some clothes here's this thing and i don't think i ever put it on it looked like something like if you were singing with the Osmonds, <laughs> you know, they'd all wear, like, you know, if they went brown, you know, it was just, it, it was, uh, it was awful. But uh, that, my mother has an excellent sense of fashion. So usually she would correct my errors and was there every morning because between the ages of what, 13 and, well, I was going to say 18, but now really, <laughs> I would put my pants on and I was obsessed with uh, having a fat ass. Oh, yeah, we had that so, mirror. So I have this mirror and I go, is my ass fat in this? She goes, yeah, you're fine. It looks fine. It's in proportion yeah. with your body. And I go, what does that mean? Like, yeah, so. Uh, Craig, yeah. having a, 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 a juicy behind <laughs> is a good thing in this world. I agree. There is songs about it. I like big butts. Bootylicious. It's a thing. A little junk in the trunk. A little junk in the trunk. Yes, me too. Exactly. So, yes. But, that, but not a 13-year-old in 1977. True. As a guy. Yeah. Who's, wearing, who's filling a painter pants. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a whole other matter. Those are awkward years. You're doing something wrong if you don't feel awkward. My skin was breaking out. You know, I broke out. Big, I remember on my forehead, I used to joke and say, it says, I'm a loser in Braille on my yep. forehead, you know. But you get through those years because everybody's going through them. 
but she never embarrassed me, Chloe Mark. Yeah. Oh, you were, oh, you're so yeah. lucky. I am so jealous. I do now. How do you mean? You know, I, I now I do shave. Oh, the the, oh well, that that had to stop. Uh, and and I don't know that she was wrong looking back, but I used to wear my hair, you know, long, and I had had always oh, had a half beard. It's still very much uh, like that. A little, a little yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I, and what was important, it wasn't so much that she was right or wrong. It was, I just wanted to be the captain of my own ship. That was all. It was more, it was that growing up stuff and, you know, kind of, hey, boundaries, boundaries. But of course, the minute you get in trouble, mom, mom, guess what? Guess what? I was hoping for something really traumatizing that still follows you today. Okay, now you've performed together in shows in the past. Any chance of a 54 Below Mother's Day 2024 performance? Oh, I intend to absolutely and find some way to include one in something. But a lot of the stuff that I've written, nothing that I've actually had produced, I was close with one of them, but a lot of the stuff that I write, because I just, I find our relationship to be very funny. My mother taught me a lot of things. I got for my grandmother too and i have to say on some level my dad who could be very funny when he wasn't being cruel he, he, he was also had a good sense of humor but my mother is is very funny and and more often more than that she has a sense of humor about herself that was probably of all the things that we've discussed i mean yes there was the keeping us in our house which was very big but uh watching somebody go through all of that and never lose their sense of humor is probably why I was able to keep developing one and realize that it is. Not, I didn't realize this on a conscious level, of course, but I learned how to defend myself using humor. Uh, I could, um, what's the word that I'm looking for when you, you want to uh, deflate a situation or, you know, make something less tense, uh, whatever the word is. Add levity or brevity. Levity. Well, add levity, but you know what I mean? Just sort of if a situation gets, because, you know, as a guy, you must sense this. You walk into a room. I think guys know this intuitively. Women don't always know this, but when a guy walks into a room, especially at a certain age, if there are other guys there, you can immediately tell it's just a feeling you get in your skin who you need to avoid. be around. Oh, no, I'm the opposite. Who you want to avoid. Well, yeah, yeah I know. To some degree, it's not, <laughs> it's, not, it's, not a, it's not infallible, that's for sure. But I had a lot of trouble with alpha male types who need to kind of pee on their territory and it's kind of just let you know who's boss the room. So I learned to walk into a room and led with kind of making fun of myself without humiliating myself or disparaging myself to kind of diffuse. That's the word I was looking for. Because basically what you're telling them is, I'm not here for your girl. Because, you know, I'll say something and the girl laughs and then the guy steps a little closer. We have a problem. It's like, mm -hmm. no, I'm just a party. So I would make fun of them. I get that too. The guys know that I am no threat, but if any of my female friends have laughed too much at me, at my jokes... You are a threat. I'm a threat. You are a threat. It's pathetic. You're a threat because you could pull that, you could pull that girl aside and say, he's not for you. That, and it's a, it's a simplistic way of looking at something like, oh, he made my girlfriend laugh, he's a threat. It's no, I'm just trying to be a guy at a party. This is what I do. I, exactly. I'm not, but I'm comfortable I, and I ran out of small talk in like 1987. Yeah. I have nothing. I, I don't want, I don't like small talk. So uh, I'm either joking around or talking about something heavy. About that. It, it's really funny. I, somebody asked me the other day, when you, you got divorced and you went to um, a game, like a soccer game or a basketball game, what did the other girls do? With my older son, everybody was very nice to me. When you were playing, all the women shifted when I came to sit down. And I wanted to say to all of them, I don't want your husband. Why didn't they I'm do that not, when you went to see Scott? I don't know. I think maybe it was, it, they were more secure with mm. all the people and at all the games when I went. And, and yes. It, it was the most awful thing. That was hard because there were families. We lived in a neighborhood. And so when my dad left, you'd figure, oh, these people we've been living next to for 10 years, they're going to come over. They're going to help. Yeah, they're going to help. And some of them were very funny, I have to say, some of them. And and we and in emergencies, there was always somebody there. But there was also a sense of the doors closing and the women standing at the door going, not, not take it yet. Because my mom's a very attractive woman. And yeah. At that point, she was modeling and stuff like that. And they were, they had a 
I mean, I, I don't blame them for being afraid, but they should yeah. have known they should, but uh, if they didn't know her, but they did know her and it's not something my mom would do. As a matter of fact, the last person who would do that was somebody who just had that done to them. So, which was kind of what happened. And my mother was uh, really- well, they just asked me about that the other day. Uh, it, was, it, it was unfortunate, but it, that was of its time. I, I don't, I hope that doesn't happen now. I think there's, there's so many areas of support they didn't exist then. I mean, you looked and you found a you found a group, a group therapy, right? Mm -hmm. And found some female friends who were in a similar right. situation, but it was rare. Yeah. Well, it was a different time. Nobody was divorced. Now everybody's divorced. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but people are just dicks. People are dicks in general. Let's face it. They're not. They're not very nice. No. Individually, we can be good. Individually, yes, humans are, are great, but collectively, on mass, you go no matter what year in history we're dicks we are absolute dicks with five thousand years of evolution i uh, just came across i'll send it to you and I, yeah. i'll say but a friend of mine named gary shapiro who died several years ago but he wrote a song and it's great and i just found it on youtube so i'm going to try to get figure out what i need to do to get the rights to it because i i love it and i and it sounds good and I remember it was the last time I spoke to him, I called him and said, I love this song. And he goes, oh, is it still up there? I meant to take it down. I'm just working on it. So in a way, it's sort of like the John Lennon song that he left, but, you know, that they finished. I want to finish this because it's great. And it's called uh, People Are Horrible Most of the Time. Cool. There's a Hank Williams one, I'll Never Get Out of This World Alive. Yeah. I love that song. <laughs> That's great. That that is just I, I put that on nearly every day. Um, yeah. So that's that's this is the concept for your show is is being raised by a single mother in the time when it wasn't cool. It wasn't a thing. It was you know, and you didn't just raise children, Pat. You literally raised a superstar actor who is known around the world who when i posted craig's episode i had people i didn't that didn't speak to me for 10 years message me and go oh my god you had craig on your show and i'd be like now you talk to me now after 10 years now you talk to me oh i love that guy i'll have to listen yeah you'll have to fucking listen to the show you should have listened 76 episodes ago anyways <laughs> You know, you should be you should be with a spring in your step, Pat, because you didn't just meet oh. the brief, you knocked it out of the park, really. Oh. Yep. Another boy too, who's who who's a, he's a good he's a good guy. My brother's a good guy. You know, yeah. he's my older brother, so it's easier to be the younger brother. You you know where all the landmines are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I don't do that. That didn't go over well. Yeah. You know, well, leave so that he, one out. Yeah, so my, I, there's some very funny stories uh, that he maybe by now he will find fun. But yep. uh, I, um, I told, like, I, I'm friends with Caroline Ray, the comedian, and I was oh, I with her, her. Uh, last month. Do you love her? And Caroline is somebody, if it works, we're, right now we're trying to get a podcast started. Oh, yeah. uh, so I went there for a month. We we taped uh, a few just practice shows. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, I've known her for a long time, and uh, she's one of the funniest, warmest people in the world. We did a sitcom together. Why did I bring her up? What was I? Doing? What were we talking about? Uh, I don't know how I wandered away from that, but um, but something about Scott, uh, my older brother. Oh, about your mum meeting the brief, and you know, he stepped on all the he stepped on all the landmines. So it's it's much easier yeah. to be the younger brother and come off, you know, like yeah, yeah. you're behaving well. All I'm doing is not doing the thing I would have done had I not seen it yeah. go so disastrously for him. You know, so uh, that's that's harder to be the older brother. He's 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 a great guy. Yeah, he's he's terrific. He's a very talented musician. I think, oh, wow, wonderful. Growing up with a mum who had done theatre, was Pat much of a stage mum? Was. Um, <laughs> or, was or is, I should say, then. Yeah, I can get too involved. Yeah. Uh, he knows, you know, did they call? Well. <laughs> What's new? It all, all uh, of that comes from, it's helpful not to have grown up actually in the business. I grew, you know, all of my friends became doctors, lawyers, whatever. They be, they, no, almost nobody went into show business. Probably the closest is one of my closest friends, Joe Levy, became a, a pub, not a publisher, sorry, an, an editor. Uh, and he edited for Rolling Stone and for uh, Village Voice. By the way, another who would be a terrific guest because he, he's uh, just musically, he's uh, on every page uh, that you're on. Uh, but he's a really interesting guy uh, and 
uh, he his industry disappeared overnight. There's the print no print. media disappeared. No so he, you know, he kind of had to uh, 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 scramble. And again, I don't remember what. I don't want to leave the story there. But was, did that have a point? It was about stage mom. Stage mom. Oh, stage mom. Well, the, I, but Joe, was I a stage mom? I think just involved. Oh, you know what it was? It was just in, involved. Yeah. And and caring. And you have to, and, and I, oh, I know what it was. Is I grew up, Joe was the closest who went into show business, and that was just print media. But he at least dealt with celebrities, and he understood, oh, it's, they're just, you know, it's just people under there. And it's often more complicated than it needs to, whatever. It's just life. And that was actually helpful to have a close friend who didn't project nonsense. But it wasn't fair. There was a learning, uh, as things started to happen for me, uh, First of all, you realize as they're happening, nothing really changes inside. You still have to walk around with your brain and your sense of yourself. I was just hearing somebody, I'm, I'm blanking his name, but he's an Irish actor. And he played the Penguin recently. Oh, Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell was just, and you know what? He's one of those working actors, it's more. He's, he's always been like on the cusp of really big star. And then to watch him really hit it out of the park under all that makeup, playing a character and doing it brilliantly. And then to have that other movie where he, he actually looks like himself and go, yes, it's not just, you know, it's it, it, sometimes you get the feeling, oh, he's doing something that maybe four other people didn't do. And he's got, you got to work your way up through that. It's like the bottom of very, very successful. Yeah. Well, he just, you know? did and then he just did, well, he just did those two, those movies and now he's on another level as far as we're concerned. And as a, as a fan and as an actor, I really appreciate how hard that is to maintain. You have to really love it. You have to really love it. And he was talking about it and he said, I don't, they said, what does it feel like if you've made it because of the Oscar not whatever it is. And he said, I don't have that feeling. And I don't know any actor who has that feeling. And I know people say that I grew up and heard actors say that. And I said, I hope one day I'm successful enough to say that because I, that can't be true. I've never experienced any level of anything. And, uh, you know, it, it's the career goes like that at those really, really high points. I never I always felt like I'm close to the line, but I still in myself and having grown up knowing who I was. And we were still a family and I had great friends and I had a good enough foundation that I never got lost in. You can get lost in success and you can get lost in a lack of success if you prioritize the wrong things. And what was always the priority for me, even beyond really diligently working very hard to persevere and make it, especially when I was living out in Los Angeles. What was really important to me were my friendships and my and my family. And when something, if there was a betrayal, which there was in a friendship, that was earth shattering to me. And it had to do with business. And it wasn't earth shattering to the other person. And I realized, oh, I, I don't know how much, you know, you have to sort of shape your experience in this business. And there's a way that I live and a way that I believe. A lot of that sense of integrity and sense of myself, again, I attribute to my mother. You know, if you have a strong parent, you're getting a constant reflection that's accurate of yourself. You know who you are. Even though it's confusing and you're growing up and going through all your growing pains, you know who you are because somebody's telling you, you know, you're getting praise or you're getting punishment, you know, to in, in sane degrees, or, you know, because somebody's raising you correctly. They're not there to be your friend. They're there, although we were, we were friends. We've yeah. always been very close, but I was also aware, this is my mother. I also knew when there was a certain tone, cut the shit, it's not funny anymore, and just <laughs> do the work. So when I see somebody like Colin Farrell say, there's no feeling of having made it, there's a feeling of uncertain, and that used to keep me up at nights, but now I love it, because I realize that's just what you feel before you start working on something. Yeah. That feeling of uncertainty, and then you have to get to work to create a feeling of certainty. It's that. If you're lucky, it's that over and over again. What's really hard are the periods in between where you're kind of, and that's what's happening a lot in the industry right now is it's rejiggering. We've got a writer strike, which is terrible. And we've also got uh, auditions don't exist anymore. We all have to send in tapes. So the odds are all scattered. Everything has changed and you have to kind of go with it, go with the change and um, adapt. Some people do it better than others. But he was asking about being a stage bum and that probably. 
it, I was saying that it always felt like somebody, uh, no matter what happened, somebody cared about me and loved yeah. me. So I was not my review, good or bad. I am Craig Bierko, Pat Campbell's daughter. Uh, his daughter. daughter. I'm right. your daughter. <laughs> really? That's an interesting Freudian really? slip, huh? Yeah. Well, that explains a lot. I'm Pat Emble's son, and and I and these are my friends. They know who I am. So if I did ever act out of line, they'd call me on my shit. But there was all there was always a temptation, and there was and and especially when I was younger, when I first got out there, a desire to to step out of my own body into the you know the sparkly Hollywood version of success, but it doesn't exist. You find out the minute you get anything, there's some people who try for the rest of their lives to make it become something it will never be, uh, which is the best I've ever heard it explained was the, uh, the actor and writer, Paul Reiser, who's very, very, very funny. I don't know if you guys know him over there. Mad about you? Yeah. Yeah. Just truly, truly funny. And we were talking once and he said, you know what's famous? Because he had gotten really, he was famous, but he got really famous with that show. And he said, fame is more people know your name than you know their names. I think that's the way he said it because he talks funny. Fame is more people know your name than you know their name. Something like that. And he said, there's nothing there. And all those years I spent in, you know, clubs as a comedian, blah, 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 uh, chasing after a certain thing. And then you get it and you realize, no, I've got kids and I've got a wife and that's what's fulfilling and all the other stuff is my job. But if you're looking for anything else, it's not going to give you confidence. But if you walk into it with confidence, uh, it will be a, a more enriching experience. And you have to have rules, though. You know, and if there was stage mothering, it was, um, I, you know, I, there were times where I, I, I was fully aware, but I was always proud of the fact. I was like, yeah, my mom comes more than anybody else's mom. My mom never missed one show. One, I used to play sports and I was horrible, but never missed a game. Never, And she had to work and she was a single parent. And not everybody's parents who were free would come to see them. My mom saw everything. And I just felt like, you know what? It didn't feel like stage mothering. It's really nice when you feel like you've got a teammate, someone who has just got your back. And when things go badly, it, there was a learning curve and for me too you had to learn the business isn't what we thought it was it's not what when you look at it on tv or on the movie screen that's not what's happening i do remember i did one show and i'm not going to say what show it was it was a very very well regarded show and i didn't enjoy it from the minute i walked there i was like I, i'm i and i called my mother and i said i have no idea what's going on I feel, i've never it's i don't even feel like this is, has anything to do with acting like i just and I explained the situation. I said, no one's relaxed. Everybody's, you just, you know, everybody's on the tip of their feet and you just feel like at any minute you might, you know. And she said, it sounds corporate. And that was the world that she had been in for a while. And that's what they do. And she told me about her boss is this wonderful guy who's like a family hero named Andy Dolsey, who was very supportive. But to tell the story you told about what you would go in and talk to him and how he was a great boss and supportive, but he also let you know that you needed to. Yeah, uh, I, he really made made my career. I mean, he made me do things I never thought I could do. Always push a little more. It's really very important in a job like that. Sometimes he would come around the desk and sit next to me. That meant something. That's a signal. Okay, yeah, you know, we're not friends. We're still the boss, but you're special, and I need to talk to you about this. Things that you really, you have to learn. But didn't you say that you would also say, like, well, I'm off to France, so I'm going to go do this thing, and he'd go, yes, you are. Like, there was always a sense of, like, a good boss, and it's just, it's good. That's what it's supposed to be, is you should never feel like you're on completely solid ground. They're on solid ground. Oh, that's right? that's the French part. I was on property. Then I worked in the corporate office, and he said, we're going to go into Europe. We're going to open a property in France. And I said, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. He said, well, you're going to. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, you're going to go over. I said, I, my French, I I." I Took high school French and college French. I, 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 what? And he said, no, you're going to go over there. Uh, we're going to send you to the Alliance Francais and then you'll go over there and you're going to have to work with the French staff and you're going to have to do French sales calls. And I said, no, no, I can't, I, I can't do something like that. <laughs> and not, I can't, I can't. He said, yeah, yeah, you can, you can. And I said, okay. So we went, I went to the Alliance process and uh, I went three nights a week. 
unmarried to Jim at this point, uh, and bringing up two other children, by the way, which came along with him. I'm going on, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I don't need this French class. that's just showing me how to buy curtains, how to buy meat, what to do, and so forth. So I said to this woman who was teaching, I said, you know, I'm in the hotel business, and I'm in a little niche of the hotel business called the Conference Center Resort Company. This is a brochure we have. I need you to translate this into French, and I need you to do that as soon as possible because I have to go over to France. I have to, first of all, my direction sense is terrible. So I've got to go over there and learn where each street is. I have to talk to customers in a language that I don't know, which is scaring the hell out of me. But I have to have this job because it's bringing in so much money at this point and I need it, even though I married this man because we just needed the double income to a daughter who was going through a very expensive school and to a very expensive college. I mean, all of this, we just needed a lot of money flowing in at this point. And I was making a lot of money and so was he. So you get tied up with all of this. So anyhow, I went over there and was doing okay in the French office. And I would go on sales calls with a French person. And then one day, the French person that I was working with was not there. And I had to make a big sales call at Deloitte and Touche which is a big accounting company. I thought, my God, I'm going to have to do this all by myself. I don't even know if I can get in the taxi and tell them where to go. I got in a taxi and somehow landed in the French district that I knew I had to be in. And I'm all of a sudden, I'm in an office with all people, everybody speaking a language that I really, I'm not comfortable in. And I think, how am I going to make small talk? Because to do sales at this point, you have to do what they call relationship selling. So you have to make a relationship with a person. And I, well, that's very difficult when you don't know the language very well. First thing I saw, oh, my God, she's wearing a beautiful scarf. That must be Hermes. Okay, that's I can do that. And now I'm going on about this lovely scarf, and I'm doing the whole thing in French to the point where I'm getting a migraine headache because my head is like bursting open, and I'm doing the brochure and so forth in French. Anyhow, very interested, loved it. I get in the cab. I go back to the hotel. I'm thinking, I'm going to pass out. And I told my boss, I said, I don't know if, if I can do this any longer. I mean, this is really too much for me. Anyhow, I get back to New York. They gave us the sale, not only for the French property, but for all the properties we had in New York. So it's like, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. You know, <laughs> without he pushing me. To the point where I was like, I can't do this any longer. I don't know if I want to work anymore. It must be like you going into a play. Yes. Okay? I can't dance. What are, yeah, you, yeah, what yeah. are you doing? For what? I can't do this. I can't. Yeah. I think that the rest of my time was, I can't. You know, I went to Denmark like that. I went to France like that. And I was in London like that. And it was wonderful. And it was terrifying. Yeah. Wonderful and terrifying. But he was a, a blessing. He's a family yeah. hero because... This was someone who was doing that for us, but... You all need somebody who's in your corner who can see that little piece of you and work on it and push you. Just push you a little more and say, you can do more than this. I had a father who did that to me, and so I recognized that. There must be something. Then I realized all through my life, I went to summer camp. I ended up being the captain of the team. It was a big deal, and I went to school. I ended up being in the valedictorian of my class in boarding school. But it's always somebody who's pushing. So I guess I must have done that with the theater. I was not an actress. I majored in theater in uh, college, but I was not an actress. But I could see both of my kids are performers. So I did push. <laughs> I don't think it was sing out Louise. It wasn't you suggested I be in show business. It was just, I do remember one moment. Uh, I've no. been out in Los Angeles for a year and a half. And I was, I had broken up with my first girlfriend and I was very sad. And I didn't have a job. And I said, I, maybe I should go back to school and get my MBA business degree, which is the least interesting thing I can think about. Uh, but I was scared. And she said, I think you should give it more time. My mother is far more practical and clear thinking than I am. I'm not a very linear person. My mother's very practical and linear. So if that made sense, I think you would have agreed. What made sense was what you're doing is hard, but I have seen what you do. And I think it's only a matter of time. And I I really needed that because I was scared. And it's not the first time. I mean, not that, you know, that was 
the first time that it, that it resonated like that, but it's not the last time, you know, I put her in, in that position and she mm-hmm. came through for me. So it wasn't, sa- it wasn't sage mothering, it was mothering. I think what yeah. uh, everybody <laughs> said to me, my older son is in the music business, do children's music. They, they write it, they market it, and they perform it. So it's a kind of show business. People would say to me, oh my God, how terrible. You have two sons in the entertainment business. You mm-hmm. must feel mm-hmm. terrible. Mm-hmm. How insecure, how awful. And yes. I would always say, oh, you got to yeah. go to college. That's, that's all I ask. Just go to college, have an education, yep. because you know what? You do what you do for an awful long time. So please enjoy it. That's, that's it. what she said. I'm working. I'm doing well with my job. They like me. I'm making money, I don't but I don't that. like the job. It's not what I was. I did it because that's what was available. And I ended up yep. here. You're doing what you want to do. Do what you want to do. It's worth it. It's worth the trouble. It's worth the pain in the ass. And quite frankly, you know, you don't that's what for that's a long one time. of those errors right now. We're in a, a period of change, and everybody's having a hard time with people who are leaving the business. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and, and the platforms are the business is literally rebirth, mm-hmm. and um, and and you kind of have to just sort of hold on and believe in yourself. That is all foundation work, and that all comes from the source. So. G'day listeners, Aaron here. We thought we'd better send a spy to Broadway to check out the shows for us. So here for today's review is our Broadway spy, Spencer. This week we're going to talk about New York, New York. New York, New York is a new musical based off of the film with music by Candor and Ebb with additional lyrics by Lin-Manuel Miranda. I truly enjoyed this show. I think it needed a little bit of work on, on the book, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. The score is beautiful. I mean, it's candor and what, what do you expect with, with these additional lyrics by Lynn manuel Miranda? It's just a perfect night at the theater. This season on Broadway, we had a lot of minimalistic sets, but this show is not that. This show has set pieces that are huge that are on stage for like 30 seconds. It's crazy. I loved the set for the show. Beowulf bore it. One of my favorite set designers working in the industry today and you have the wonderful direction and choreography by susan stroman and let me tell you if you think you've seen tap dancing just wait until you see this show the way that susan stroman choreographs a dance at the top of the empire state building is one of the coolest things i've ever seen on stage and of course we then get there the end of the show the title song new york new york and just the, the way that, that these performers, Colton Ryan and Anna Uzella, is just the way that they perform that, not only their entire arc, but their performance in the title number, New York, New York, is worth the messy script of the show. The orchestrations are fresh and sound like they could have been written in the 40s, but yet also today costumes choreography actors are just so wonderful and i just think the show needs a little bit of polishing in terms of the script and the story they either need to do that or turn it into more of a show with multiple vignettes now the question is is the show for tourists or purists this is a show for tourists this is the definition of a show for tourists it is a show that embodies the New York City atmosphere. Within like the first 10 minutes of the show, they take you on a subway. They take you all over the city. You see all of Manhattan in this show. If you love New York City, you will love this show. It's running at the St. James Theater, and it was nominated for nine Tony Awards. And I hope we can catch you in New York, New York soon. While Craig's star was rising, if you will, especially in the sort of the 90s, the 2000s, from a parent's point of view, were you worried? Yeah, I'm always worried. What were you worried about? Like, what were you worried I, about? I just think, it, will it last? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Will it last? That's fair. You know? yeah. Will it work? And so it's just an incredibly intrusive industry to be in for anyone, really. Well, especially now. Jason Alexander, if I'm sure you 
I saw him online the other day and got to work with him recently. We did a, a, yeah. a, a tribute for Gilbert God. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We got to hang out a little bit. He's the friendliest, nicest guy who's absolutely nothing like the role he plays on Seinfeld. He's one of the most confident performers I've ever met. And Larry David said the same thing. And Larry David's nothing like the character he plays. They're, these are very straight, you know, it, it, not in that sense although they are in that sense, but they're very straight thinking, hard working, and they love what they do and they love other performers. Like both of them love to laugh, which not all comedians do. There are comedians who will say, that's funny because they've lost their laugh. They're so competitive. Yeah. But um, when a comedian yeah. does that, it's weaponized or it's it feels like why did you become a comedian someone like larry david did it because he liked laughing a lot and that's what he does he laughs a lot he enjoys if you say something funny he'll laugh and i just really respect people like that who don't lose that was another thing i got from growing up and and doing you know my mom it, it, whether she mentioned or not was the president of paris and players and so she could have just said i want my kid at the show but i had to audition for gypsy in the school and i got into it because the director cast me and that was important that's good stage mothering and a good lesson anytime i'm doing anything and i work with somebody who's complaining and listen we all complain but when it gets stupid when it's all about you know something you know the green m&ms you know what does it say i said no green m&ms if there's a problem like that a silly you know indulgence because nobody said no to them in 10 years you know I always remember, I have a sense memory. It's very strong about being in this high school where we used to perform these plays for Harrison Player and realize all of these people had just been to work for a full day. These are dentists, you know, some of them were students, but most of them were professional people, married people who at the end of their day chose to spend another three hours putting a play together just because they loved it, building the sets. And I loved all of them. In fact, my first crush was Naomi Gross, who played yeah. Sarah Brown in Guys and Dolls opposite my mom's Adelaide. <laughs> I still have that sense of, I get to do this every single time. And sometimes it's very hard and you have to deal with political things or people. And it's different when it's you're being paid because you could easily screw up if you're not paying attention. And mm -hmm. so it's not community theater. It's different. But community theater never left my blood. It was I wouldn't have it any other way. It gave it... it even more than my theater training, it gave me a sense of just having that sense of memory of these people, they love it so much that they'll do it, not get paid. And they're getting paid to do something else. And they're exhausted for doing that thing. And they're here anyway, that this is such a privilege to be able to do this when you get to that to go off the rails when it comes down to minor points is silly. I just walk away from it. You know, people who, who can't appreciate what is good. There's a lot that isn't and is difficult. Like what Colin Farrell said, I think that's really quite brilliant that maybe so brilliantly said that if somebody isn't an actor, they might not quite hear what he's saying, which is yeah. I used to feel insecure because I think what he was trying to do was win. You know, I want to win that photo finish and be as big a star as I possibly can. And now he realizes the joy of just being able to work. And the feeling of being afraid is actually means I'm in the world. That's as good as it gets. But the late, great Carrie Fisher used to call the best off. You have to appreciate the best off. You know, the best off would be, yeah, it's not a great, it's, it's an uneasy feeling that's telling you things are going well. And what everybody wants or what certainly what I wanted from the business when I joined it is I can't even relate to. It's something a younger guy who hasn't had experiences would think about. And that's, it has to do with popularity and uh, cutting corners. And then the joke is show business kind of adds corners. Yeah, I've heard that a few times. Yeah, so I got what he what Colin Farrell, it was, that's actually one of the great things I'm going to carry with me. Yeah. Because having that kind of ease with, oh, I was being pushed as this young leading man and I'm never quite making the brand and pit mark, you know, but he's so close that, that anybody else would go, what are you complaining about? But it's all relative. And then to actually at an, at an age that's, it's not too old that you're, you're not, you don't have the rest of your career ahead of you to say, I get to enjoy the fact that I'm just right now I'm working and I just did something that was well received. And that means I'm going to probably get another couple of shots at it. That's all I need. And that I heard that and I was like, yeah, that's because it confirms when it's difficult for you. We all go through those times you can reset your gauges and, yeah. and not everything is so precious and important anymore. But then there's the, the perspective of the parent that 
watching your kid go through all that and Very difficult. that's where the stress comes in the worry comes in and that's why i was sort of interested in that's a difficult one well i've I, without being specific you know there's some things that you go through and they're they're exclusive to show business they don't happen in any other areas but because your name might be known or you're associated with somebody whose name is known a newspaper might write something about you that has nothing to do with the show it's about your life it's personal that was happening to me for the first time and i needed to call and tell my family listen they're good you know, people are going to call and ask you about this and i realized i heard the word all i was doing was imparting information i realized oh i'm telling my mom this is i'm in the midst of a scary situation i need to respect that too and it was a, a funny balance my first reaction was i can't take care of you and take care of the situation but now as somebody who's got a, a few more years on him and a couple more of those experiences i realized Yes, I can. Not everybody understands the Sanskrit that I, it took me years to learn how to read. And uh, there's a lot of crap that comes with this and a lot of nasty people. Yeah. So it's worth explaining that to your family, walking them through it the way they would if you had entered or trying to understand their, what was happening in their profession. It's not so different than the corporate world. It really no. is. That's, at, the, at the end of the day, it isn't. It's just louder. And we like to give each other more awards for it. Yeah. Now, I just got one last question because we've obviously been going for long enough. Pat, what has been the most memorable meal that Craig has cooked for you? And was it a root beer sandwich? <laughs> We're really not into cooking. <laughs> Have I ever cooked a meal? I think the only thing I've ever cooked. Taken my, out. I've taken, taken her out. Yeah. No, I'll I'm not. I'll tell you what he did. This was really lovely. For my 60th birthday, he took me to a place called Canyon Ranch. It's in a spa. It's, it's a, spa. a spa. Okay. Yeah. And they have one in New York. And they have one in Tucson, Arizona. And the one in Tucson, Arizona is really the best. We love it. And we had a wonderful, wonderful time. And yeah. I think I'll always remember that. Yeah. 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 That, that, that was really special. You can't repay. There's no way to repay. And, you know, you always want to. It's they a have a very good relationship. Very unique. Yeah. You repay yeah. by being we a lot. We, we laugh, laugh a lot. We laugh a lot. Yeah. Good. And what was the first thing he bought you when he became famous? Or the first expensive thing, extravagant? Oh, well, that trip was very expensive. The race of South oh, Africa. I, I, uh, I, would, I, I would normally, uh, you know, I, I don't live that way anymore, and nor was it responsible. It was a part mm -hmm. of being young. But for example, instead of doing laundry, before Matthew Perry did Friends, we did a show called Sydney with <laughs> Valerie Bertinelli. And we were not that, we, I mean, I love the guy, but we weren't the greatest influence on each other because we were both just slobs. And when you're slobs and you're, you're making some money, so we both realized we had the same habit. We didn't do our laundry. We'd go to buy a new shirt. We just go to a store, buy a new shirt. And then finally we grew up and realized we have to do our laundry. If it's laundry, yeah. So, which is a silly lesson to have to learn, but I did have to learn that. That's an example of you think you can cut corners. Now you've just got more shirts than you need. Now you have too many shirts. Wash your shirts. You know, so so you're not a chef, Craig. <laughs> no, I'm not a chef. There's not. I can't think of one thing that I've ever cooked for anybody. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, and also, I hate cooking. It takes too long. Too long. Yeah, look, I too long. I agree that it takes way too long. If I never Jim's a good cook. If I never saw the kitchen again, I'm very happy. And Scott's a cook. Yeah. Scott can cook. Yeah. My brother. Yeah. But okay. I just thought I, I it's gone. I eat it in thirty seconds. No. I don't want to like three no. hours. If to I never saw the kitchen yeah. again, yeah. I'd be happy. So I'm happier to to take her out somewhere. Yeah. Uh, than to cook. But, and nobody needs to eat. But I'm, not, I'm not a big eater either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not I'm not a foodie. No, I've never been a foodie either. Uh, I I love food, but I don't eat much. So the foods that I love, I really love, but I like where I eat processed crap. And if I'm going to have like fresh bread, it needs to be fresh bread. I'm not going to have like frozen bread or something like, you know, from the freezer or whatnot. Like I'm really fussy about the foods I eat. I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be. But that, it's funny that um the root beer sandwich meme that you keep oh, posting yeah. the nancy thing it reminds me of being 16 years old being a punk with a mohawk tattoos and piercings mm -hmm. and we would be in the kitchen and someone would spill their beer so we would get bread and we would soak it up and eat the bread no you don't want to do it kids you do not want to do it it's disgusting <laughs> you don't want to do it that. really it is that's a good idea
No, no. But, and, and that's funny because people, I got a lot of people saying, you know, Twitter is kind of screwed up now. And Elon well, Musk yeah. is wise and there. People are angry. And it's, you realize it, it's literally nothing. So now we're fighting about nothing. Yeah. It's like a false story, you know? And um, it is not nothing. It's a, it's, it was a habit that people had. And, a, and he sort of bought it, changed everything around, changed the value system. And now the people that you were, communicating with like it's all, all the algorithms group i don't see the same names anymore i don't have the same amount of uh, people so yeah. i just thought why am i bothering to write anything i'm just going to start printing the same nancy comic every day the same one because why not and i chose that deliberately because i've never even read a nancy comic and never found her particularly funny and i never found the root and the idea of that root beer sandwich thing is i don't find that funny i think that's just it's a uh, comic i thought you were a fan but it's so funny people would were projecting that's what i find interesting is you do something i had no agenda other than i don't know what else to post i'm sick and tired of yelling about this uh, everything that's going on politically because that never goes anywhere carrie fisher used to say in her inimitable style don't use your a material on twitter she used to say don't jerk off into a bucket she's right she said use it to warm up and then get writing so i just thought what do i do i got nothing to say i'll let me and i just thought on some level people will start projecting on it and they did mm -hmm. people people were troubled like what not they weren't worried but they were like what do, what's it mean what does it mean and i was like and i all i did was send them that same comment what it is is nothing it's just interesting to me to see i don't know it was just that was my response to what's going on on twitter this is i have nothing to say did this all seem stupid this is what i'm gonna do it struck a nerve in some way it was very funny to me yeah uh, i thought it was funny and some guys like blocked <laughs> And I'm like, Godfather, this is clearly trolling us all. Like, that's that's what I got, was that you were trolling everyone. So In a way, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, I think one guy suggested that. Some guy actually mentioned it on his podcast. I never heard it, but but he liked it. Yeah. He thought it was very funny. But I was like, I want to hear what that guy's idea was, because I'm not trying to do anything. But yeah. people project things. That's it. Anyways, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you. This is such a privilege doing this show already, and I don't take it lightly. I really don't. So thank you for letting myself and our listeners in to your family on this Mother's Day. It is nice to meet you, Aaron. I'm a fan of I'm a fan of yours, and I think your show is great. And I listen to it, and I think you're a talented host. And I know we've talked about this, but I know that that you know like, it's not easy starting something up. No. It's not easy starting something up, and all you're experiencing is what everybody else experiences. You get you know you know it's nobody invites you into show business, right? You have to hang your shingle and then just start. And that's what you're doing. But you have every right to be doing it. It's as good as any other podcast. And it makes me laugh. I think you're very clever and, and, and funny. And I know how much you love it. So don't stop. Don't no. stop. No, thank you, Craig. That's, you know, you gave up your time the first time to come on the show. And then you reached out afterwards and listened to it and said some words that I had to print off because that'll keep me going. So to, to have taken the time. Uh, and then when Evan left, you helped get me off that ledge. Oh, yes, yes. I really did by saying, don't quit. You know, so thank you. It, it is, it's an honor. It truly is. It is a privilege. And I won't keep you guys any longer. It's been almost three hours. We'll blame Craig because he likes to talk. <laughs> I do. I do. Yes, yes. Does, does it get that from you, Pat? Oh, yeah. But I love, I love no. him so much. <laughs> I have been, I have horrible ADD, and you know what it is. I when I talk, and I've spoken to other people about ADD. The experience is that you you want to make a point, and it's not as there's you know the brain works differently. So I don't know what yeah. it's like to have another brain, but I'm walking around what it is I want to <laughs> say, and I keep spray painting it so other people yes. can see it. it. Just takes longer. I totally get it. I totally get it. Yeah. I do exactly. So. Well, if you've been listening, you would know that I I tend to ramble and. I do that thing as well. Well, I'll be saying something, right? I have a really good point. I get halfway through and I've changed direction. And then I'm like, shit, what was I talking about again? And so I sit here for 10 minutes going, what the hell was I talking about? I cannot remember. And it's just, yeah, I agree. It's ADHD. <laughs> that's right. Well, and that's also a ADHD plus age is you're going to end up on a lot of side roads mm -hmm. and ask people how to get back to the main road. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. I mean, it, 
never and boring. It, that's when you know somebody loves you. But you do. But but my mom isn't is no shrinking violet. So she'll say, "Let me talk." Yeah, please. Yeah. Please. Just a word. <laughs> yeah, I I tell my co-host to say, "Aaron, shut up." Aaron, just shut up. Yeah. Let us talk for once. And, you know, it's I, I'm right. driving this train, so I've got to sort of keep it on the tracks a lot of the times. I used to do the wash and come back and dry it, and he's still talking. Still talking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have, um, I won't mention her name, but I was dating a girl for quite some time, and uh, she, and it got to her. She would say, I can't, we, please. It was too much. And yep. and she said, you, you know, she, why are you, she said, why do you need to talk about it? Why do you need to talk, say this? Why does it need to be and inside? And I really wanted to say it's true it's like because it's better than the alternative yes <laughs> that's right i mean if i shut up you're gonna start talking we don't so, do yeah. that <laughs> you probably know who it is. yeah at least i know i'm entertaining that's the thing like <laughs> you know so i can i can talk for an hour problem is that people think it's an indulgence really what it is is it's uh it it feels like an extra toe or something it's a little I, i'm not ashamed of it or anything but I, that's the feeling I feel like i'm trying to spray paint yeah no look i'm i'm totally with you because everyone comments god aaron you talk so much there are little things that i do that i i, I try to do them but uh, like i'll start accelerating and um, I feel like I'm talking the same speed, but it was a shrink a few years ago. A great guy, he sucks, uh, who's got that show on it. Okay, yeah, yeah, on Netflix, yeah. Yeah, on, on Netflix, wonderful, which I highly recommend. He yep. was my shrink for a while. I said, I, I don't know what to do. It, I was actually talking about talking. And <laughs> he said, you know what happens is you talk and you get excited about an idea and you start to accelerate. You don't feel it. And what happens to people? Tell me what happens. I said, I can feel them getting angry at me. And all I'm doing is telling them about something I'm thrilled about. Yep. And I can't understand why they're not thrilled. He goes, you're not talking to them. You've lost them. And they're <laughs> upset with you because they're waiting for you to circle back around and pick them up. <laughs> he said, Tell me a story. And I told him a quick little story. He goes, tell it again and tell me like you're stuck in molasses. And I said, really? Okay. And I told him a story like this. He goes, mm -hmm. how does I feel? He goes, like I'm stuck in molasses. Like it felt silly. He goes, that's how people talk. It didn't sound slow, but you've just been sprinting. So it feels slow. Yeah. So I, I, I do have to remind myself. Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> I struggle with that. Yeah. Especially doing this show. It's a good quality talk show host. Like, you got to fill in a lot of silences, so it's a good, it's a good quality. Yeah, that's it. And think on my feet, and that's it. But anyways, I just um, I'll, I'll let you go. But Craig, can I get you to do the hospital stuff? Because I know it's obvious. It's been nearly three hours. I'm so sorry. No, oh, this is we've had fun. It's been yeah, fun, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. we were really looking forward to this, and thank you so much for taking the time out and and, no. and honoring my mom and mom. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a that's a privilege. Oh, I just wanted to say that uh, several years ago, I went to a uh, a hospital, the Loma Linda Children's Loma Linda University Children's Hospital, and it was really kind of a favor. They're they're in Loma Linda, California, just outside of what I would call the Celebrity Beltway. Yep. You know, far enough out that. I was a get, you know, to come in and do like a photo op. And really what it was, was a favor for our cousin, Dale, who uh, works uh, for the hospital. And specifically, she works for an organization that gets big hearts for little hearts. Uh, it, and and they raise money for, you know, for the for the hospital, which is uh, they they're the pioneers of the, the infant heart transplant. And um, I had an amazing experience when I went there, which I think I told you about last time or well, yeah. you with some other time, but it, it, it's not boring. It was, it was a life-changing experience and I expected it to be just a lunch and a drive, mm -hmm. but it was life-changing. And I called my mother as soon as I got out of the hospital, because I said, I, I was in tears. I mean, it was a very moving experience. And I said, I, I, I can't believe how different this was than what I thought it was going to be. Because uh, I'd been avoiding it for years, and I had to do it because uh, yeah. this was family. So, and, and it was, and I thought, I, I, it's too late for med school, and Lord knows nobody needs my hands rooting around inside their body, changing things <laughs> around. But I, I'm not too old to start pimping my famous friends and start making some money for the hospital. And that's, I did a couple of 
benefits, yeah, celebrity yeah, yeah. celebrity benefits for you know, and I got, and got yeah. people together. And every every single person that I called showed up, and if they couldn't show up, like Matthew Perry did it the first year, and then when he couldn't the second year because he had had gotten he was doing a week on uh, West Wing, show the West okay. Wing. Yep, yep. He said I can't do it, but he sent the fee. He sent his fee to the hospital. Oh. I thought that was that's. That was a very cool thing. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, oh, Fred Willard, Lorraine Newman. Uh, the list goes on and on. People who just showed up. And, um, and, of, and of course, Boo was a big part. We used to make little videos and raise money mm. for the, you know, $10 here and there. Because what, you know, the, the, univer the, the, the hospital does very well. And they have, you know, they, they have these benefits, a huge benefit every year where they make like $28 million dollars. I'm not going to be able to do that, but they, they have this thing, which I love, which is they've never turned any child in need away. And uh, I thought I can contribute to that. Let's help them keep the doors open. So that never needs to change. Cause that's the thing that really moved me, was watching the, how the doctors dealt with these kids. Yeah. Uh, some of them who were in horrible shape waiting for hearts, you know, I just thought for the time being and maybe forever, but uh, I don't have a kid. So I'm going to take this on like you did. Uh, and I'm going to take this on as a responsibility. It's one of the greatest decisions I have ever made. And um, I, I keep looking for ways to contribute more. It was difficult to do it this year without my partner, Boo, and having lost Boo. But in her name, I want to come back and, and start doing that again. So I'm figuring out how to do that. I, uh, if you're because you're so kind. And good luck editing this, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but. <laughs> And I can send you a shorter version of it. We can do that if you yeah, want to take a shorter version. No, that's fine. I, I'm going to send you a, so you can put it on the web page the address. If you'd like to contribute to the hospital to help me help them keep their doors open so no child ever gets turned away, which is amazing because the doctors are world class. Uh, if a child is suffering from, from something, they'll helicopter them in if they can to this place, the, yeah. the, the best of the best. And I'm so proud to just be affiliated with them. Uh, so thank you for that a shout out and if anybody wants to contribute the information is there and i'm starting a memorial page for boo which will be on instagram in the next couple of weeks so oh, beautiful. follow me at mr craig bierko on instagram there'll be information about joining that page which won't just be a memorial page it'll be for anybody who's lost a pet wants to send their thoughts in needs to find some comfort because i really found that to be one of the hardest experiences of my life and people who checked in with me like that guy I mentioned earlier, Peter Chadsky, it really meant the world to me. Of course, my family was there. They knew that will be there. And also it'll be a source of support for uh, these, you know, these angels at the hospital. Yeah. So Beautiful. Uh, thank you for that. No, no worries. One day we'll, I'm going to produce the roast of Craig Bioko and we'll raise money for the hospital. How about that? Excellent. I look forward to it. I've been wanting to produce a roast so badly on this show. We just need a victim. Plenty of people with plenty of material. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, you would be the perfect candidate for it. But anyways, I'll let you guys go. Yep, thank no you so much. Wonderful to meet you. Yep, no worries. I thank you for taking the time. And and Jim, in the background, g'day from Australia. Hi. Well, uh, thank you so much, Aaron. And I look forward to talking to you again. You're great. You're yep. wonderful. No worries. Great experience. Alrighty, uh, I may sound really, really tired right now because I've been editing my ass off to get this up on time for Mother's Day in Australia and USA and wherever else in the world it is Mother's Day today, possibly Canada. Anyways, uh, so huge, huge, huge happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there and all the guardians and everyone like me who is raising children that we perhaps may not ask for, but they're there. And we look after them and they tell us how much they hate us all the time. So happy Mother's Day to us. All that shit that we go through is worth it. Again, a huge thank you to Craig and Pat for joining us and to Jim for lending us his beautiful wife for the evening. That was, I, I could say it was a joy. It was a thrill. It was a privilege. I, I just, words cannot describe what an amazing experience that was uh, to be trusted in that way. So thank you again. Anyways, you can find us at Thrush and Treasure or at Thrush and Treasure Podcast on Instagram uh, or on YouTube, all that jazz. Uh, Patreon at Blooming Theatricals by the Tunniston Tales. Read the Tunniston Tales. I did record a new chapter um, or a new snippet for the commercial earlier in the middle of editing this two hour and 40 minute episode. 
which I managed to cut out 30 minutes or cut down 30 minutes. I didn't cut out all that much, really. Um, just a few little juicy bits here and there that are for nobody else's ears. Anyways, that's it from us. Happy Mother's Day again. You take care. Look after each other. Thank you so much for listening. And we shall see you next time with a co-host. Uru! Nice. Thank you. Bye.